2015. Remind everyone present to turn off their mobile phones, and as meeting papers are provided in digital format, tablets may be used by members during the meeting. This is day four of the stage two of the planning bill, and I welcome again the Minister for Local Government and Housing, Kevin Stewart, and his accompanying officials to today's meeting. Some MPs who are not committee members but have lodged amendments to the bill will again be in attendance today and are very welcome. So I call amendment 232 in the name of the Minister, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. Thank you, Convener. Uh, these amendments rename simplified development zones as master plan consent areas. Uh, there appears to have been some confusion uh, around this part of the bill. There is uh, a misconception that planning permission is not needed for these areas. In particular, we heard at stage one that the use of the word simplified was being interpreted by some as de deregulating rather than strength strengthening planning. Um, I want to support and encourage more public sector led development. This mechanism puts planning authorities in the lead in planning their places rather than just reacting to developers' proposals. Early and effective community engagement and a strong design-led approach to delivering quality development will be required in all cases. Uh, this is not a developer's charter or a bid to lower standards. Indeed, the previous convener noted uh, that the evidence that we have been hearing is that what is proposed sounds just like enhanced master planning. It is a master plan, will give upfront consent for the type of development that the planning authority considers most appropriate for an area. Uh, master plan consent areas is therefore a more accurate name, which should remove any misunderstanding about what we are trying to achieve here. And I ask the committee to support this group of amendments. Thank you, convener. Thank you very much. Does anybody wish to speak on this? Graham Simpson. Thanks, Convener. Um, I think this is pretty, pretty straightforward. It might, on the face of it, look like there's not a lot of point in changing the name, but nor is there any great objection to it, so we'll support these amendments. Okay. In that case, can I ask the Minister to wind up? Uh, nothing more to say, Convener. Okay, then. The question is that Amendment 232 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Agreed. Thank you. I call amendments 233, 234 and 235, all in the name of the Minister and all previously debated with amendment 232, and invite the Minister to move amendments 233 to 235 on block. Does uh, any member object to a single question being put on amendments 233 to 235? Okay. The question is that amendments 233 to 235 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. I call Amendment 236 in the name of the Minister, grouped with Amendment 284. Minister, to move Amendment 236 and speak to both amendments in the group. Uh, convener, I'm happy to bring forward Amendments 236 and 284. Uh, they respond to a point made by the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee at Stage 1 and follow up on a commitment I made to reconsider the matter. Uh, to avoid any further confusion around terminology uh, for these and the following amendments, I will be referring to master plan consent areas when discussing provisions relating to simplified development zones in the Bill. Uh, the Bill, as introduced, would have allowed a scheme for these areas to disapply the normal controls on the display of ad ad advertisements and apply controls set out in the scheme instead. However, the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee was concerned that this would remove parliamentary oversight over the rules of the display of adverts. And in response to these concerns, Amendment 236 removes that, this provision. Um, I want planning authorities to lead and incentivise development through the upfront consideration and granting of a range of consents, reducing uncertainty for all. Uh, we heard from Renfrewshire Council, who prepared Scotland's uh, first town centre simplified planning zone, that despite the scheme granting planning permission, the ongoing need to separately apply for advertisement consent within the area can cause delay and reduce certainty and confidence for investors. So I maintain that it would be useful and proportionate if a master plan consent area scheme could include scope to grant advertisement consent in addition to the range of other consents. 
Section 183 of the 1997 Act already allows regulations to make different provision for different areas when it comes to adver advertisement controls. Amendment 284 would add master plan consent areas into that non-exhaustive li non list of types of area which different provisions can be made. Uh, this will allow the existing control of advertisements regulations to be amended to make special provision for master plan consent areas so that the planning authority could consent advertisements through a scheme within the par parameters permitted by the regulations. Planners would bring forward the same thinking and scrutiny that would otherwise go into the consideration of individual applications and provide a more holistic, streamlined consenting framework within the scheme. This approach addresses the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee's concern about a loss of parliamentary oversight because any future amendments to the control of advertisement regulations in relation to these areas will be subject to parliamentary scrutiny. I'm grateful to them for highlighting this issue and I ask the, the committee to support these amendments. Okay, thank you very much, Graham. Yeah, um, as uh, convener of the uh, uh, Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee, I welcome uh, the Minister's uh, amendments in, in this area. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Minister, wind up. Uh, nothing more to say, convener. Thank you very much. In that case, the question is that Amendment 236 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. I now call Amendment 12 in the name of Graham Simpson, grouped with Amendments 2, 9, 5 and 20. I would point out that Amendment 20 is pre-empted by Amendment 156 in group Simplified Development Zones, land which may or may not be included. Graeme Simpson to move Amendment 12 and to speak to all amendments in the group. Um, thanks very much, uh, Convener. Um, uh, apologies, I um, may unusually take a while on this, but it's uh, an important uh, amendment, Amendment 12. It's an important grouping. Um, initially, uh, of course, the bill had uh, no mechanism uh, for capturing any land value uplift, and it was uh, something that the committee uh, looked at very closely um, at stage one. Um, a planning resource article this month uh, said that more than eight in ten planning and development professionals believe the planning bill will fail to provide a system capable of improving housing and infrastructure delivery uh, according to a new survey. The omission uh, of any reference to land value capture was, in my view, a clear missed opportunity. Uh, in our manifesto for the 2017 election, we said that communities and public authorities should benefit from the increase in value of land achieved through gaining planning permission. Uh, Ruth Davidson has given a couple of speeches backing the idea uh, and has argued that Scotland should build a new generation of new towns to help ease the country's housing shortage. My Amendment 12 would provide a powerful tool for local authorities to build new communities as well as extensions to or significant developments within existing settlements. Um, so I've lodged the amendment to provide that where a planning authority uh, establishes a uh, master plan consent area, uh, it may include provision for compulsory purchase. The amendment sets out the basics of how the purchase price is to be fixed, it requires ministers to set out the rest of the detail about the process by regulations. And this would include how any provision of the Land Compensation Scotland Act 1963 is to be disapplied or modified for the purposes of this scheme. Amendment 20 also in this group simply provides that where regulations are made by ministers, they should be subject to the affirmative procedure. COSLA have stated that there is potential uh, for this to be a useful tool uh, for councils Shelter and the Adam Smith Institute have supported such a reform. Councils will be able to invest money gained through their own decision to grant planning permission to spend on affordable housing, new roads and better infrastructure. We could avoid the wrangles over who pays for what and how much that often holds up development. We could deliver varied places. We could unlock land for smaller builders and self-builders. Uh, the focus of a previously debated amendment, we could deliver more houses and more affordable houses. It's genuinely exciting, but it's far from new, convener. We should learn from the past. The Town and Country Planning Act 
1947 enabled the state to acquire land at levels close to existing use value until it was amended in the Town and Country Planning Act 1959 and with new compensation arrangements in the Land Compensation Act 1961-1963, as it was in Scotland. Alongside powers provided within the New Towns Act 1946, the 1947 Act enabled the establishment through development corporations of post-war new towns. And the new towns programme ultimately led to the establishment of 32 communities for 2.8 million people and successfully paid back its entire borrowing for the delivery of the towns in 1999. I live in one of those towns, East Kilbride, which was the first in Scotland. Convener, analysis by the Centre for Progressive Policy indicates that land awarded planning permission is worth more than 275 times the agricultural value across England and in 2016-17 generated £18 billion in increased land values. The state collected about £5 billion through, in England, Section 106 agreements, the community infrastructure level, levy and public land sales, leaving private landowners uh, and their intermediaries with pre-tax profits of around £13 billion. I said during stage, the Stage 1 debil, debate on this bill that planning is often all about money, and these figures illustrate the point very well. Now, importantly, my amendment provides for compensation payable in respect of land purchased under the powers in this amendment. That's only fair. Uh, Andy Whiteman um, is a long-standing supporter of land value capture, but his amendment 295 does not include a provision for compensation and that doesn't seem fair to me. So we won't be supporting his amendment today, but I do accept the principles behind what Mr. Whiteman is trying to achieve, uh, and I guarantee we can work together uh, for stage three and encourage the government to get on board with us if this is passed. We can't keep kicking this can down the road. The issue, um, convener, has been examined across the UK. Just last month, the Housing Communities and Local Government Committee at the UK Parliament concluded that extra funding for new local infrastructure and affordable housing could be raised by reforms to how the increase in value of land resulting from public policy decisions is captured. The committee argued that there is scope for raising additional revenue from the consideration of new mechanisms for land value capture and reform of the way councils can compulsory purchase land. The report highlighted the success of the first generations of uh, new towns, which I've already mentioned, which acquired land at uh, or near to existing use value and captured uplifts in land value to invest in new infrastructure. Uh, and they've called for reform of such powers uh, through amendment of the Land Compensation Act. Uh, that would lead to a much needed boost in house building. It, it was reported, convener, in this week's Sunday Telegraph that the Chancellor himself may announce proposals in the budget next week. Uh, we don't need to wait for England to move on this. We don't need to wait for the Land Commission to report. Scotland can be at the forefront of this radical public policy shift, and I believe that this amendment will help transform the landscape of residential and economic development in Scotland it can play an important part in a radical new planning system, and I urge the committee to support it. Thank you, Convener. Thank you very much, Graham. Uh, Andy Whiteman to speak to Amendment 295 and other amendments in the group. Well, thank you very much, <coughs> uh, Convener. Uh, Graham Simpson art has, has articulated the case for land uh, value capture. Uh, Scottish Greens have a manifesto commitment to secure reform to the Planning Act to allow local authorities to acquire land at its existing use value. And as Graham said, I'm <clears throat> also aware this was a manifesto commitment of the Conservative Party in the 2017 general election, uh, and it was also a recommendation of the UK Labour Party's uh, in their recent Housing White paper. Uh, it's a topic of growing interest amongst uh, policy makers. And I would remind members, as indeed Graham did himself, a provision enabling this was introduced in section 48 of the Town County Planning Scotland Act 1947. Uh, repealed in 1959. In the UK, 90% of new housing is by speculative volume builders. Uh, this is a very strange model 
of house building compared to the rest of the continent. Uh, they compete first for land, and they have to pay the uplift value, which is transferred ultimately onto house buyers. So typically, 30 to 50 per cent of the cost of new housing is land value, created entirely by the public through planning authorities granting, acting in the public interest uh, in granting planning consent. Eliminating this, and we can invest 30 to 50 per cent more in higher quality, longer lasting, larger, more energy efficient, or build more homes at the same cost. And as Mr Simpson pointed out, our sister committee in the House of Commons uh, in uh, September this year conducted an inquiry into this topic and made recommendations uh, on this. Amendment 295 is my version of a provision uh, similar to Amendment uh, 12. Like Amendment 12, my amendment restricts the deployment of a land value capture mechanism to master plan consent areas. This is not because I think it should be so restricted. I think it should be far more widely uh, available. Uh, but because I'm conscious that in reintroducing provisions that were last in force 50 years ago, there is significant risk of causing uncertainty and confusion uh, in the land market, and therefore the need to have a proportionate approach uh, at this stage is critical. The establishment of um, master plan consent areas uh, contains, creates the ideal environment within which to reintroduce this concept in a controlled and manageable way. I carried out a consultation uh, on this proposal uh, during May and June this year. I received 23 responses, of which 11 were in favour, and 9 were opposed, and 3 had mixed views. Amongst those who were uh, supportive uh, were Planning Democracy, Rural Housing Scotland, the Scottish Federation of Housing Associations, Chartered Institute uh, of, of Housing. Uh, those against include the Scottish Property Federation, Homes for Scotland, uh, Persimmon Homes, Scottish Land uh, and Estates. I attended a meeting of the Compulsory Purchase Specialists and met with the authors of a recent Scottish Land Commission paper uh, on the topic. And as a consequence, I developed an amendment that is more tightly drawn than Amendment 12 and was informed by my consultation out of which two key principles emerged. The first is that the existing use value of any land in a master plan consent area must be established and known at the point at which the land is so designated. In Germany, this is described as the land price freeze mechanism. To leave the valuation until some years hence, as Amendment 12 does, will risk interfering with the legitimate expectations of the landowner who may have under undertaken preparatory works with the attendant risk of a legal challenge under Article 1, Protocol 1 of the European Convention of Human Rights. The second principle is that the provisions are only made available to meet the housing needs of the community and to uphold the human right uh, to housing, and those are reflected in my amendment. This makes clear the public interest and provides a robust defence under the public interest exemption in A1 P1. Now, I'm aware that the Scottish Land Commission is currently undertaking work in this area, uh, but I do not know when the next legislative opportunity will arise, or even if I will be around to take advantage of it. This is a planning provision. This is a planning bill. We have a planning bill about once a decade. Both Amendment 12 and 295 represent a tightly focused and proportionate measure that will allow local authorities to use this power in defined circumstances in the public interest. And as Graeme Simpson has mentioned, this has the potential to transform the supply of housing, particularly affordable housing in rural as well as urban areas. Now, in light of the duplication of the derives uh, in the bill where both Amendments 12 and 295 to be passed, I will not be moving Amendment 295 on the understanding that Graeme Simpson agrees, and I think I've uh, heard him already do this, to discuss how his amendment can be further amended before stage three to accommodate the principles I outlined earlier. These principles arose out of consultation with interested parties uh, and are, in my view, essential to ensure a workable, fair, proportionate and legally defensible mechanism to capture land value. Thank you, convener. Thank you very much. Any other members? OK, in that case, Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, Convener. Uh, Mr Simpson said that there uh, is no mechanism for land value capture in the bill. Um, there is. The infrastructure levy is a, a mechanism for capturing an element of land value. Uh, and the bill also seeks to clarify use of Section 75 planning obligations in this way. Uh, both of these amendments apparently seek to require ministers to make provision in regulations about the compensation payable for compulsory purchase. 
While the intention behind these amendments shown in the headings may be to make provision for compulsory acquisition of land, in fact, they do not use the word compulsory in the substantive provisions. The sections that these amendments seek to introduce uh, would, in fact, operate to regulate voluntary acquisition of land in certain situations. However, as I recognise the in intention uh, was to create rights of compulsory purchase, I will consider the amendments as if that is what they would do. Uh, the compulsory purchase of land is a, a very serious issue. Uh, since the 18th century, the process for compulsory purchase in the UK has been almost exclusively laid down in primary legislation in detail to make sure the power is not abused. Uh, and I do not see any reason here to change that. Uh, the Scottish Government is interested in the concept of land value capture, uh, and that is why we have asked the Scottish Land Commission to investigate options uh, for that uh, more effective use, capturing uplift values uh, in Scotland. And they are due to report back in spring 2019. Um, Graham Simpson mentioned new towns quite a lot in, in his contribution. And the Scottish Land Commission has recently carried out a study of previous attempts uh, to capture land value uplifts. And while new towns were a successful approach, uh, the 1947 development charge was not successful. Uh, and in fact, it discouraged development. And that is why we need to look at this area very carefully indeed. Um, the proposal uh, that is in front of us would ignore the ongoing work uh, and the range of options for land value capture that could potentially be considered in Scotland, because there are a range of ways that land value capture may be attempted, uh, and changing the compulsory purchase compensation rules is just one of them. Uh, once we have the Land Commission's report, um, we will consider whether we should move towards consultation and preparing legislation. If the Land Commission conclude that changes to compulsory purchase compensation would be helpful, then it may be possible to combine changes to compulsory purchase with the proposed bill on compulsory sale orders that is being considered uh, for later on in this Parliament. Um, there are a, a number of technical deficiencies in these amendments that I consider would make them unacceptable in their current form. For example, Andy Whiteman's version would require the local authority to value all the land in the area to which the scheme relates, not just the land they propose to purchase. There are issues with the valuation methods contained in Amendment 12 that could, in some cases, lead to higher compensation than at present. And I also question why these rules would only apply in a master plan consent area. What justification is there for paying less than market value in this area and not another? If a landowner inside the master plan consent area will potentially receive less for their land than one outside the area, is that fair? And surely it would, will lead to more opposition to master plan consent areas being made when they are meant to be a collaborative positive tool which can support and speed up much needed development. And one of the key criticisms of the current compulsory purchase system is that it is too complex uh, with multiple overlapping processes. So how does it help to add another one? Uh, but beyond these specific issues, there is a, a more significant principle at stake here. Um, I recognise the rights to housing uh, that Mr Whiteman has quoted, uh, but rights can never be considered in isolation. Uh, the rights to housing have to be balanced with the rights to property, also enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and of more direct rev relevance to the powers of this Parliament in the European Convention on Human Rights, which legislation of this Parliament must be compatible with. The courts have uh, long held that compulsory purchase is compatible with EHCR, but only where exercised proportionately and when owners receive fair compensation. As a general rule, the taking of property without payment of an amount reasonably related to its value would not be justifiable under the EHCR. 
In the absence of uh, special justification, fair compensation would be expected to equate to the market value of the land taken. And while there may, be, uh, may possibly be scope for making changes to the rules for assessment of land compensation in certain circumstances, this will uh, require very careful scrutiny and justification. Both of these amendments imply that the compensation payable in such circumstances will be less than is currently considered to be market value. Uh, there must be very real doubt that compulsory purchase in these lines proposed would be compatible with the EHCR. And if not, these amendments would be out with the legislative competence of this Parliament. And I hope that committee members will take that issue very seriously. In short, um, I believe that it is uh, premature to attempt to change the rules for compensation for compulsory purchase via amendments on this bill without proper analysis and consultation. Uh, we have had no formal public consultation on this key issue. Uh, Mr Whiteman has uh, mentioned uh, his uh, own uh, uh, um, uh, views from his findings, but we have... Uh, He's not published uh, the full results of his consultation. Uh, there's, there's, uh, certainly, I'll take Mr. Whiteman. Uh, just for the record, I will be publishing them. Um, that's fine, but they're not published as yet. Um, the Scottish Land Commission, the Scottish Law Commission, the Royal Institution of Chartered Surveyors, and Homes for Scotland all agree with uh, the analysis and have expressed their concern uh, about these proposals. And indeed, the Scottish Comp Compulsory Purchase Association has written to the committee setting out their concerns in some detail. We have asked the Scottish Land Commission to investigate the options for more effective land value capture. They need the time and the space to complete their work. Um, I would therefore ask Mr Simpson not to press his amendment and Mr Whiteman not to move his. Thank you, Convener. Thank you very much. Um, Graham Simpson to wind up. Not really much to uh, add, Convener, um, but I hear what the Minister's uh, saying. Um, I'm certainly prepared to speak to the Minister um, afterwards, but I'll, uh, on this occasion, um, I'll, I'll be moving it. Yeah, thank you. The question is then that Amendment 12 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Those in favour? Four. Those opposed? Three. The Amendment 12 is agreed to. I call Amendment 295 in the name of Andy Whiteman, already debated with Amendment 12. Andy Whiteman to move or not move? Not moved. Thank you. I call Amendment 237, 238, 239 and 240, all in the name of the Minister and all previously debated with Amendment 232. I invite Minister to move Amendments 237 to 240 on block. Moved, Convener. Does any member object to a single question being put on Amendments 237 to 240? Okay, if, uh, the question is that Amendments 237 to 240 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Agreed. I call Amendment 241 in the name of the Minister, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. I would point out the following preemptions. Amendment 242 preempts Amendment 13 in this group. Amendment 156 preempts Amendment 20 in group simplified development zones, land value capture. The Minister to move Amendment 241 and speak to all amendments in the group. Uh, convener, the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee suggested that types of land that may not be included um, in an SDZ or a master plan consent area uh, should be set out in the face of the bill. Um, I accepted that point and undertook to bring forward an amendment to that effect, uh, including a power to add or remove entries by regulations. Uh, my amendments in this group fulfil that commitment. I want to see master plan consent areas being used in a wide range of circumstances, and I also want to make these provisions as clear and easy uh, to follow as possible, rather than adding complexity. Uh, my Amendment 250 uh, provi provides restrictions on world heritage sites and their buffer zones, uh, European sites, triple SIs, national scenic areas, Ramsar sites, marine protected areas, and places covered by orders under Part 2 of the Nature Conservation Scotland Act. 
These are all international or national designations, and I believe this is clear, easy to understand, and the appropriate level of restriction to set in primary legislation. I suspect that, uh, that it is unlikely that uh, authorities will want to introduce master plan consent areas in these designated areas, but I'm happy to provide clarity on this to avoid any doubt or confusion. Uh, we have worked with the relevant agencies on this, specifically Historic Environment Scotland and Scottish Nat Natural Heritage, and they agree with my approach. I want to see this mechanism used more widely and confidently to promote good placemaking. Significant restrictions in locally designated areas would continue to curtail the scope for planning authorities to proactively plan for the right kinds of development in their places. So I'm not proposing to include local designations within the restrictions in the Act so that we can give authorities the opportunity to decide for themselves what works best uh, in their area. Uh, turning to Amendment 13, uh, in the name of Mr Simpson, um, I have some concerns, in fact, I have serious concerns uh, about preventing master plan consent areas and conservation areas in Greenbelt land. Uh, preventing master plan consent areas and conservation areas uh, would take away the opportunity uh, they have for planning authorities to actively plan for and support town centre investment and regeneration. Uh, many local authorities uh, may want to use this approach to deliver on the town centre first principle. Uh, for example, uh, schemes could allow for certain changes of use within town centres, helping vacant units come back into pr productive use. Uh, the committee also heard at stage one uh, from Petra Bieberbach from PAS that there are currently more than 30,000 empty homes, most of which are in town centres. She emphasised the need for a more imaginative approach to unlock them and to repopulate our town centres. And I know that some authorities are already keen to follow the example of the Renfrew Town Centre and use existing provisions for simplified planning zones to support their town centres, but are unable to because of existing restrictions on SPZs and conservation areas. If the committee supports Mr Simpson's Amendment 13, uh, it would significantly limit the potential of master plan consent areas to make a real difference to our town centres and to support their vitality and vibrancy. Uh, Mr Simpson's amendment would also restrict master plan consent areas in the Green Belt. Scottish planning policy makes clear that Green Belt designation is a tool for local authorities to direct development to suitable locations. Local authorities can set out uses that are appropriate within the Green Belt, uh, such as the reuse of historic agricultural buildings or recreational uses compatible with an agricultural or natural setting. Indeed, we have been approached recently by one uh, local enterprise who sees the potential to support reuse of steadings and supporting uh, the rural microeconomy. A master plan consent area uh, could facilitate that kind of development uh, which are appropriate uh, within green belts. And a full restriction in green belts would lose that opportunity. Convener, I agree it is important uh, to provide clarity on the scope of master plan consent areas on the face of the bill. But any restrictions should be set at the right level and not limit the ability of local authorities to proactively proactively and positively plan good quality development and investment in their local areas. I would be happy to discuss this further uh, with Mr Simpson before stage three uh, to make sure we get the detail right uh, on this issue. And I move Amendment 241. Thank you. Graeme Simpson to speak to Amendment 13 and other amendments in the group. Um, well, thanks very much, Convener. Um, and can I first of all um, welcome uh, the Minister's uh, comments there? Um, my Amendment uh, 13 uh, sim simply set out to replicate uh, what was the uh, uh, existing position around simplified planning zones uh, and where they uh, couldn't, couldn't be set up. Um, so that's all I was 
trying to do. The government amendment uh, uh, 250 um, place, it places similar restrictions uh, on where these uh, areas can't be set up. Uh, but in some respects, it goes further than my own amendment, but doesn't include uh, green belt and, and conservation areas. And having um, considered, considered it, not just listening to the minister uh, today, uh, but speaking to uh, stakeholders and others, um, I'm minded to agree with the government, uh, and I will not be not be moving uh, my own amendment. Um, I welcome uh, the fact that uh, Mr. Stewart is responding to the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee again. Um, so, as I say, I'll not be moving it, and I will be uh, supporting the government amendment 250. Uh, the government amendments 241 to 248. Uh, in this group, along with 293, can best be described as technical, uh, and we'll be supporting them as well. Uh, Amendment 156 appears to be a tidying up exercise, rolling together regulation making powers to be dealt with by the affirmative procedure, and we support that as well. And Thank you, uh, Convener. <clears throat> Amendment 13 and 250 implement the recommendation of the Committee Stage 1 report. Uh, to place on the face of the bill uh, where master plan consent areas cannot be designated. And in principle, I've got no objection uh, to this, but I do not agree that the list of such designated sites should include national scenic areas. National scenic areas include settlements where there's a need for more affordable housing. I have the map here, large parts of West Ross, Assent, Sutherland, the whole of Harris, South Lewis, Cantail, uh, Loch Shiel, quarter of the Cairngorms National Park, SNH have a consultative role, as the Minister is aware, in national scenic areas where a development of more than five houses is proposed. They do not have a consultative role where uh, any of those um, uh, proposals are specifically provided for in the local development plan. And the Minister will probably be aware of recent controversy over affordable housing in, uh, in um, North Sky, uh, etc. He'll also be aware that Circular 9-1987 contains the relevant rules in this regard. It's my view that master plan consent areas could, could play an important role in providing rural housing, especially where the land value capture provisions are made use of, but certainly where they're, they're, they're not. To exclude them by law from being available in national scenic areas is illogical when development can already take place under existing planning provisions uh, and when they have the potential, particularly, uh, when, when master plan consent areas have the potential to provide a more effective means of providing rural affordable housing uh, in many areas. And for those reasons, I cannot support amendments 12 or 250 um, and would welcome further discussion with the Minister uh, on the points I've made with a view possible to possible amendment at stage three to remove national scenic areas from the list of designated sites. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Minister, wind up. Uh, thank you, Convener. I'm grateful uh, to Mr Simpson uh, for his indication that he won't move his amendment. Um, and I am more than happy um, to have further discussions with Mr Whiteman and others uh, around about national scenic areas so that we get this absolutely right for Stage 3. Thank you very much. Uh, the question is, is that Amendment 241 be agreed to? Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. Thank you. If agreed. Call Amendment 242 in the name of the Minister already debated with Amendment 241. The uh, Minister to move formally. Agreed. Uh, moved. Sorry, <laughs> convener. <laughs> agreed. Uh, the question is that Amendment 242 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. I call Amendment 243, 244, 245, 246, 247, and 250, all in the name of the Minister and all previously debated, and invite the Minister to move amendments 243 to 250 on block. Uh, moved on block, convener. Objection here. Okay, uh, given that a member has objected, I put the question on each amendment individually. I, I have no objection to 243 to 249 being taken on block. Okay, well, I'm, uh, does any other member object to 243 to 249 be taken on block? No, right, OK, we will take 243 to 249 on block. Yes, uh, does it... <laughs> we all agreed on 243 to 249. Thank you. Okay, okay in that case... Um, Minister to move 250. 
Yes. Minister, move 250, please. Uh, moved, Convener. Thank you. Uh, the question is, uh, Amendment 250 be agreed to? Are we all agreed? Uh, no. Okay. Those in favour of Amendment 250? Six. Uh, those opposed to 250? One. Amendment 250 is agreed to. Call Amendment 296 in the name of Monica Lennon, grouped with Amendments 297, 298, 299, 300 and 301. Monica Lennon, to move Amendment 296 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. Um, I move the amendment and uh, good morning. I welcome the Minister's earlier opening remarks on simplified development zones, reframed as master plan consent areas. And um, my view is that the use of master plan consent areas uh, has to be as transparent as possible and should support the local development plan as the foundation of a plan-led system. Um, the best way um, this could happen is for master plan consent areas to be designated during the formulation of the local development plan. And if that's not possible, the local development plan should be amended to include any new master plan consent area. Um, I believe that we have to be careful not to undermine the local development plan making process, especially when we're all trying to increase community involvement. Uh, so it's right that SDZs or master plan consent areas align with the local development plan. So these amendments would restrict the ability of planning authorities to bring forward SDZs or master plan consent areas at any time. Um, I have been a little bit sceptical about SDZs during um, our scrutiny of the bill. The simplified planning zones, for example, have been completely underused. I think we've heard of two examples. Um, I think master plan consent areas can be uh, potentially a very good tool, but they will be re resource intensive, and, and I hope that that will be looked at. Um, but I'll be moving amendments 296, 297 and 298, convener. OK, uh, thank you very much. Adam Tompkins was to speak on 299. Graham, are you going to be speaking on his behalf? Yeah, I'll, I'll speak on behalf of uh, Adam Tompkins, uh, if that's OK, convener. He's uh, in a, another committee at the moment. Yeah, indeed. Um, so, uh, Mr. Tompkins has amendments uh, 299 uh, um, His amendment um, 299 simply ensures that there's a regular time period where a planning authority must evaluate whether a simplified or well, master plan consent area uh, would be beneficial to an area. Uh, so, it, it ensures they have to take, basically take a look at this. Um, every five years, uh, and I think that's uh, that's entirely sensible. Um, so obviously we'll we'll we'll, we'll support that. His his amendment uh, 300 um, really goes with two, the, but the 300 and 301 go go with 299. 300 uh, simply sorts out some <coughs> rather uh, woolly drafting. So I'll move those and um, Monica Lennon's amendments. 296, 297 and 298 seem to be, me to be fairly straightforward. Should it help to improve the process? Uh, and we'll be supporting those. OK, thank you very much. Uh, Minister. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, amendments 296 to 298 in the name of Monica Lennon uh, would greatly damage the appeal of master plan consent areas and restrict their use, and I cannot support that. Uh, throughout the process of planning reform, I've been clear that we need to strengthen the ability of planning in Scotland uh, to deliver good quality development. Master plan consent areas could be a powerful tool to support the delivery of local development plans, but I don't believe their preparation can or should be tied uh, to the local development plan preparation cycle, and there are several reasons for this. Firstly, uh, master plan consent areas are a delivery mechanism, so they should be prepared within the plan's delivery period. Planning officers from Glasgow and Edinburgh told the committee uh, that this mechanism could support the delivery of the development plan. And I agree with this, and to do that effectively, it follows that there has to be a plan in place first. 
Uh, but Ms Lennon's amendments would mean that preparation of master plan consent areas would need to be twin-tracked with the preparation of the local development plan. And that could lead to authorities wasting effort and valuable resources in preparing a scheme to support a proposed allocation which may not end up being included in the final plan. Uh, that would be costly and ineffective and a real and damaging deterrent to the use of this mechanism. Uh, for many sites, uh, it will only be once they're into the delivery phase of the plan cycle that the need for a, a master plan consent area might emerge. For example, if nothing is happening on a site that is part of a, an area's spatial strategy and land supply, the authority might want to prepare a scheme to support its deliverability and to attract investors. Secondly, uh, we need to ensure that master plan consent areas uh, can be brought into play to react to changing circumstances uh, in any area. Uh, Ms Lennon's amendments would limit the ability for planning authorities to respond quickly and decisively to significant events. For example, if a, a major local employer uh, was going into administration uh, and its site was threatened with closure or, or, or was closed, the local authority should be able to step forward and take action at that point to support jobs for its people in its area. The authority could set out alternative uses for that site, putting in place conditions uh, for the right kind of development, protecting and enhancing their local economy and working with the community to provide a new vision for that place. If Miss Lennon's amendments were supported, the authority would have to hold back, possibly for years, while it gets its local development plan underway. Thirdly, uh, these amendments could place significant pressures on local authority resources. Uh, we have to be careful about overloading the development plan process uh, with full technical appraisals. Uh, there will be upfront work required from planning authorities to prepare master plan consent area schemes, and we want to allow them the time and the space to do that properly when they are not caught up in the midst of working on their local development plan. Indeed, we've seen the implications of that in each of the pilots we're supporting, where the local authority planners have been trying to progress their scheme at the same time as they prepare their local development plan. This has led to resourcing issues and impacted on timescales. Uh, we need to learn um, from these very real experiences. Both the uh, Renfrew Town Centre and Hillington Park SBZs were prepared out with the development plan process. They were fully consulted on, but did not attract ob objections. To delay schemes like this, waiting for the local development plan is not necessary and would delay investment in places around Scotland, such as the £25 million the Hillington Park SBZ has generated for its local area. The preparation of schemes must not be limited to being twin-tracked with the preparation of the local development plan. And I would strongly urge the committee to reject these amendments to ensure master plan consent areas are properly considered and taken forward by planning authorities at the most appropriate times in a way that they can have the greatest positive impact. Uh, turning now to Mr Tompkins' amendments, uh, 299 to 301. Uh, the bill includes a, a duty in paragraph 5 of Schedule 5A for authorities to publish a statement setting out how they've considered which parts of their area it would be desirable to make a scheme for to help bring this type of mechanism further to the fore in authorities' thinking. Under the current legislation, planning authorities are already required to consider in which parts in which part or parts of their area it is desirable to create simplified planning zones for and to keep that question under review. But given the extremely limited number of zones which have come forward to date, I'd say it's arguable that planning authorities have not been regularly considering this matter. 
opportunities to radically reposition planning as a leader and an enabler of development should not be lost. So I've set out a more transparent approach where planning authorities have to regularly publish a statement of how they have fulfilled their duty to consider making schemes. It might be possible to link this with the local development plan delivery programmes, which are to be updated annually, and that could help provide us and the wider community and industry with a picture of how each authority is considering delivery of their local development plans and the use of schemes as part of that. The Bill's provisions uh, allow ministers to use regulations uh, to prescribe minimum standards as to how frequently planning authorities must consider the question of which part or parts of their area it would be desirable to make a scheme for. Mr Tompkins' amendments uh, would require authorities to do that, this at, at least once every five years. I'm happy uh, to accept that requirement and leave it open to authorities to report more often if they so wish. Thank you, convener. Thank you very much. And uh, Monica, to wind up. Thank you, convener. Um, I welcome the, the minister's remarks. Um, it gives me an opportunity to, to come back. Um, I think it's regrettable that we've heard quite a bit of scaremongering there. I think the minister began by saying that these amendments would be greatly damaging. But if we can just go back a step, because what we have in front of us in the bill is proposals to shift uh, plan making, local development plan making, to a 10 year cycle. That then provides a high level document which sets out a vision and a 10 year strategy for an area. And I welcome the fact that we will maintain a plan led system in Scotland, but that's a highly discretionary system which allows uh, very skilled planning professionals and their colleagues to apply the right. Um, discretion and flexibility. So, so yes, we'll hope to have a generation of local development plans which provide certainty and, and guide development in a, in a moment, Minister, and guide development to the right places. But I think around this table, we all hope that these plans uh, will remain flexible in their approach. And, you know, I, I think it would be unfair if we let it hang the year that when it comes to shocks to local economies, businesses closing down and so on, that the sole responsibility to sort that out lies with planning departments. I can think of many times in the in the last few months when East Kilbrides, in particular, is Scotland's first new town, has had to, uh, you know, there's been closure after closure in the high street and business parts locally. I mean, I raised that with the former cabinet secretary for the economy. It took six weeks to get a response about what government could do to work with local government. And I had to raise that with the first minister to get a reply. So um, it's not simply a case of what planning does. I don't think for a minute that, that, that planners would be sitting on their hands, um, you know, not facing up to these challenges, but it's not planning alone. And the minister talked about resource um, and, and these things being resource in, in, intensive. Um, I don't think the, the, bar the biggest barrier is what is there isn't in the local development plan. It's the resource around the table, not just in terms of having the right number of planners. We've talked well, in a moment, we've talked at length about a 23% reduction in the Planning Authority workforce since 2009. You can't be serious about economic growth when you're cutting council budgets and we're looking at that level of decline in the planning workforce. So what we do need are highly skilled planners, people who can do economic development, people who can do that liaison with the private sector. So we don't get to a point, Minister, where we have to react to shocks in the economy. We have robust local development plans and, I have to say, strategic development plans that can prepare for these challenges to our economy. But I'm happy to give way at this point, uh, Convener. Um, I would have to say um, that, first of all, Convener, that I'm not scaremongering. I'm giving very real examples of what can happen. Uh, and I'm not saying that uh, economic shocks in areas are the sole responsibility of planning departments, far from it. Uh, but we have to be able uh, to give people the tools uh, to react to these difficult situations, which can arise even in the best of economic times. Um, as I've clarified, um, master plan consent areas are a tool uh, 
uh, to support the plan's deli delivery rather than an integral part of the plan. Uh, so it's not necessary to trigger an amendment to an LDP whenever a scheme has to be made. Uh, Miss Lennon is not suggesting, I don't think, that uh, LDP should be amended every time the planning authority grants planning permission. So why should they have to when they issue uh, a master plan consent? Uh, Miss Lennon's amendment risks putting planners back on the constant treadmill of updating plans, rather than focusing on placemaking and delivery, uh, which is ultimately what matters, rather than added pr procedures. Um, we've you, I'll be very, uh, I'm finishing now, convener. Uh, we've included provisions around consultation and engagement and publication of master plan consent area schemes, so there's no need to amend a local development plan to ensure that those steps are carried out, convener. Yeah. OK, thank you. OK, so if I can go back to um, one of the reasons why I've put the amendments forward is because we all want to increase public confidence in the planning system. So we've talked at length about the local development plan making process and the need to get more people from the community around the table to make sure that we're making sensible decisions about the communities in which they live. If we have a situation where a local development plan has just been signed off, has just been adopted, and then weeks later, um, there's various different master plan consent areas coming forward. Um, what does that say to the people who gave up their time to come to public meetings, to get involved as stakeholders, and things rapidly change. So I welcomed the Minister's initial clarification this morning um, about the master plan consent areas. I think there's other worthwhile amendments which would curtail the Minister's uh, right to designate them, because, you know, Minister, you know, you're not a planning authority. It's the planning authority that knows best about the area working with the community. So, uh, in principle, I've come round to the idea of your master plan consent area, but I think it's really important that we maintain public confidence and that there is, you know, I don't see the, the problem in, in making sure that this process is properly aligned with the local development plan. Um, and I don't think anyone um, needs to be frightened um, that there's a, there's a lack of master, master plan consent areas. The most important thing for master plan consent areas uh, to, to be effective is for hard cash to be available to invest into areas. And it's not the planners that hold the push strings on these things. So I think we have to remember that too. OK, thank you. Uh, can I ask if you're going to press up with... Oh. I'll be pressing the amendments. Thank you very much. In that case, the question is that Amendment 296 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Those in favour of Amendment 296? Those opposed? Sorry, three in favour, four opposed. 296 is not agreed to. I call Amendment 297 in the name of Monica Lennon, already debated with Amendment 296. Monica Lennon to move or not move? Move. Okay. Those in favour of Amendment 297? Oh, sorry. The question is that Amendment 297 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. No. <laughs> OK. <laughs> yes. Uh, a nod ahead is not quite the same. The, the, OK. Those in favour of Amendment 297? Three. Those opposed? Four. Amendment 297 is not agreed to. I call Amendment 251 in the name of the Minister. Already debated with Amendment 232 and the Minister to move formally. I uh, move, Convener. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 251 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The amendment is agreed to. I call Amendment 298 in the name of Monica Lennon, already debated with Amendment 296. Monica Lennon to move or not move? Move. Okay. Uh, the question is that Amendment 298 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Uh, those in favour of Amendment 298? Three. Those opposed? Four. Amendment 298 is not agreed to. I call Amendment 299 in the name of Adam Tompkins, already debated with Amendment 296. Graham Simpson to move or not move on behalf of Adam Tompkins? Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 299 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The amendment's agreed to. I call Amendment 300 in the name of Adam Tompkins, already debated with Amendment 296. Again, I ask Graham to move or not move. Move. Uh, the question is that Amendment 300 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? 
the amendment is therefore agreed to. I call Amendment 301 in the name of Adam Tompkins, already debated with Amendment 296. Adam Tompkins to move or not move, Graham? Moved. Thank the question is that Amendment 301 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. The amendment is therefore agreed to. I call Amendment 93 in the name of Andy Whiteman, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. And I would point out the following preemptions. Pay attention. Uh, amendment 93 preempts Amendment 56 in group directions, etc., form and publication. Amendment 14 preempts Amendment 252 in group simplified development zones renaming. Amendment 303 preempts Amendment 293 in group simplified development zones land which may or may not be included, and Amendment 253 in group simplified development zones renaming. Amendment 95 preempts Amendment 57 in group directions, etc., form and publications. Amendment 96 preempts Amendment 254 and 255 in group simplified development zones renaming. And Amendment 304 preempts Amendment 256 in this group. And after that, I ask Andy Whiteman to make some sense of that, please, and to move Amendment 93 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. I suspect we'll have to make sense of some of this at a later stage. Um, the amendments in this group, um, in my name, are designed to limit the power to initiate the designation of master plan consent areas to planning authorities alone and to remove the various powers of ministers to direct planning authorities otherwise. In other words, master plan consent areas are not to be considered as an alternative form of statutory planning application procedure open to anyone uh, to pursue, um, including my sister in Switzerland who featured in stage one debates. In, in our stage one report, we recommended that proposals for master plan consent areas should form part of the local development plan and the only planning authority should have the statutory right to bring forward proposals for a scheme. This uh, recommendation was never intended to prevent anyone, any party, including my sister in Switzerland, from um, requesting or suggesting or advocating that there be master plan consent areas. It merely removes the statutory right uh, to make such a request. Amendment 93 removes the power of Scottish ministers to direct a planning authority to make a scheme, and I move Amendment 93 in my name. Amendment 14 in Graham Simpson's name removes the statutory right of third parties to apply to have a scheme made and have the right of appeal where this is refused. Amendment 94 removes the power of direction of Scottish ministers to direct a planning authority to notify them of any proposed scheme. Amendment 95 removes ministerial powers of Colin. Amendment 96 removes the power of Scottish ministers to, take a to take, make a direction or to make or alter a scheme where a direction has been issued under paragraph 6 which said paragraph six is deleted by amendment 93. And amendment 97 removes minister's direction making powers over procedures. Monica Lennon's amendments further remove provision in schedule 5A, which I think I agree with, but I'll listen to what she has to say. Thank you, convener. Thank you very much. Uh, Graeme Simpson to speak to amendment 14 and other amendments in the group. Thanks, uh, thanks again, convener. Um, so amendment 14, uh, it's one of those many amendments where um, it must be completely baffling um, to people what it actually means. Um, it's one of those where you have to check the bill and see what uh, lines 29 to 39 are uh, and work out what it means if they go. So I can save members the effort of doing all that and explain. Um, the amendment removes the power to request a master plan consent uh, area uh, from third parties or, in, or individuals. Uh, and during stage one, uh, Andy Whiteman, as he's already said, uh, referred several times to his sister in Switzerland uh, and questioned whether she could re re request such uh, a zone. Uh, so I'm uh, going to call this amendment the Andy Whiteman Sister Amendment um, because it makes, uh, makes a change to Schedule 5A inserted into the 1997 Act by Section 10 of the Bill so that it no longer allows for any person to request that an authority considers setting up a master plan consent area. Um, and that's uh, uh, achieved by deleting paragraphs 7, 8 and 9 of Schedule 5A. It's quite straightforward. Um, it's what the uh, committee recommended. Um, so I'd uh, uh, 
urge the committee to support it. I welcome Monica Lennon's amendments 302, 303, 304, and Andy Whiteman's amendments 93, 94, 95, 96, and 97, uh, which uh, he's already uh, explained. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Monica Lennon to speak to Amendment 302 and other amendments in the group. Thank you, um, Convener. I'm supportive of the amendments to delete the Minister's ability to direct planning authorities regarding uh, simplified development zones. That's the amendment in Andy Whiteman's name. Um, just to clarify for Andy Whiteman, my amendments 302, 303 and 304 are consequential to previously debated amendments 296, 297 and 298 which uh, sought to tie simplified development zones into the local development plan timeline and procedure to prevent contradictory and parallel procedures. Um, and I explained previously that was to try and ensure consistency and remove any pre uh, potential duplication with the 97 Act. Um, sure. So, just trying to follow this, those amendments are consequential on amendments that have just been voted against, so I presume Monica Lennon will not be pressing them. Oh yeah, because Andy lost me the vote. <laughs> we'll take the convener's advice. <laughs> that would be the position of the thing. It's up to you. But... Right, okay. Well, I'll give Andy Whiteman a chance to change his mind, so I'll press them. And... Okay, right. We'll see how we got on. <laughs> okay. um, but yeah, if I can just then, I'll, I'll just finish that by saying, um, yeah, in support of, of Graeme Simpson and Andy Whiteman's amendments, um, I, I made a point earlier on ministers are, are not planning authorities. They don't have the same expertise as a planning authority um, and neither have they gone through the in-depth process of consulting with the public and putting together a local development plan. Um, I said previously I'm happy for master plan consent areas to be part of the tools a planning authority can use to meet the needs of their local population, but I don't believe that they should be at the disposal of ministers. I'll finish okay. there, convener. Thank you very much, Monica. Uh, Minister, to speak to Amendment 256 and other amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, convener. Uh, the amendments we've heard about in this group uh, would have a severe impact on the operation of this positive new part of the planning system. Uh, the process we've set out for uh, making or altering a master plan consent area is well thought through, uh, and we have been testing it in a, a series of pilot projects, as I've already mentioned. Our provisions are more streamlined than the existing provisions uh, for preparing simplified planning zones. They ensure appropriate and tailored engagement is carried out and that representations are taken into account. Uh, we have explored the new process with planners working on the simplified planning zone housing pilots who are grappling uh, with the old legislation. They view our changes as a marked improvement. Uh, they are proportionate whilst ensuring greater early engagement. Uh, Ms Lennon's amendments 302 to uh, 304 uh, propose removing numerous sections of this process uh, without replacing them with an alternative. Um, I recognise that Ms Lennon sees this approach as supporting her other amendments that have already fallen uh, to tie master plan consent areas to local development plans, but all of what she proposes um, would create a vacuum. Uh, to put it in simple terms, uh, local development plans set out spatial strategy for a whole local authority area, whilst master plan consent area zones issue actual consent for the development of a specific area with any associated conditions. I do not consider uh, that the procedures and consultation requirements for local development plans are appropriate for master plan consent areas. And I cannot see how Ms Lennon's amendments would allow both processes, again, following on from our last situation, to fun function properly or be achievable in a reasonable time scale and with the resources that are available to planning authorities. So I would ask Ms Lennon not to move those amendments. Uh, Mr Whiteman's amendment seeks to uh, take ministers out of the picture uh, in relation to master plan consent areas. However, I do believe that there is value uh, in ministers having these powers. Uh, the power to direct a, a planning authority uh, to make or alter a simple uh, 
uh, a master plan consent area scheme or for ministers to make or alter a scheme themselves could be used to very positive effect in Scotland, for example, to pursue the delivery of priorities in the national planning framework, which of course will have been fully scrutinised and approved uh, by this parliament. Uh, ministers could also direct a scheme be brought forward to support other projects of national or regional significance. For example, again, in the case of a serious economic event, uh, like the closure of a, a major employer, a scheme instigated by ministers could help drive forward action with all levels of government working together to enhance the place's prospects. As an example, uh, there is a very similar provision in Ireland where orders can be made requiring a planning authority to prepare uh, a strategic development zone scheme and bring it forward within two years. Uh, and that has been used in a very positive way to deliver developments of national significance, including uh, the redevelopments of Dub Dublin Docklands and strategic housing developments. This is not about centralisation or taking control away from local authorities, uh, and I do not anticipate the power will be used often. Um, and I will actively encourage and support authorities to be proactively bringing forward master plan consent areas where they are clearly needed. In terms of notification and calling, uh, I'm proposing that master pl uh, plan consent areas should have fewer notification stages uh, than the current simplified planning zone provisions require. Uh, and the bill does not repeat the requirement for planning authorities to notify ministers as soon as they decide to make a master plan consent area, uh, or when they place it on deposit for representations. This isn't necessary. I've taken a more proportionate approach, uh, allowing ministers to issue a direction setting out particular types of schemes that should be notified to them. Uh, this should work in a, a similar way to the notification of applications direct, uh, direction under which certain planning applications are notified to ministers where there are potentially issues of national importance involved. Uh, for example, uh, that could be where there are objections from a statutory agency or where uh, the planning authority has a financial interest in that master plan consent area. Um, a, a scheme will issue a consent and for consistency, I think it's right that the planning authority should notify ministers of their intention to adopt the scheme just uh, in some limited circumstances. Ministers intervene very rarely in planning applications, uh, and I would expect that to be the case also for master plan consent areas. Amendment 97 deletes the provisions that would allow ministers to issue directions about procedure and provision of information. Whilst I would not expect to use this power on a regular basis, it is important to cover uh, those unique situations where in relation to a specific scheme, something specific should be done that would not be applicable to all schemes. Examples could include requiring the planning authority to consult a particular local organisation uh, with a special interest in that scheme. Such case-specific requirements could not be predicted or set out in regulations but could be issued as a direction to the relevant authority. The power in paragraph 24.1b of the new Schedule 5A could be used by ministers to require additional information from the planning authority to inform their decision as to whether they should call in a particular scheme before it's made. These are important powers to have in place in the interests of full and proper engagement and in ensuring decisions made by ministers in ex exercising their functions are made on a fully informed basis. Amendment 14, put forward by Graham Simpson, uh, would remove the power for a person to request a master plan consent zone to be made. Uh, this is an established process uh, and we are not aware of any wider evidence or cause to remove it. It's worth looking at the Hillington Simplified uh, 
planning zone as an example. Since it was adopted, it has seen the planning authorities notified of approximately 28,000 square metres of additional floor space, equating to over £25 million of investment in the area. That scheme was initiated by a third by a party other than the planning authority. Uh, in the case of Hillington, that was the landowner. But it's not just removing a right of landowners. Uh, we see uh, master plan consent areas as a positive delivery tool that can support all kinds of developments offering benefit to different types of groups. For example, uh, a community group could request a scheme to support delivery of their local place plan or a business improvement district or local chamber of commerce might propose one to support town centre regeneration. It could be used to put in place the consents needed to help their vision become a reality. This could also unlock funding streams for the community to take those plans forward. We have proposed a, a well-structured process uh, for master plan consent areas with proportionate powers for ministers to intervene in appropriate circumstances in line with similar arrangements for planning applications. The amendments proposed by members would leave that process unbalanced and full of holes, and I would ask the committee not to support them. My own amendment in this group, 256, is a technical amendment. It simply makes clear the exact day on which a period ends when the start and end months of a different number of days. Uh, given the length of this group, I hope we can avoid a debate and the wonders of the Gregorian calendar. Um, I'll take Mr Simpson. Uh, I, I will be brief. Um, I've listened carefully to, to what the Minister uh, has said. He's made some, um, he's made some co cogent arguments uh, around uh, Amendment uh, 14. Um, I, I will still be pre pressing it, but I think... Um, from what he said, there is an opportunity. Um, I hope he agrees to have further d discussions about this and perhaps be rather more specific uh, in the bill over who or what organisations could uh, bring forward these, these areas. Uh, convener, I'm always ha happy to have further discussions, uh, and, and I'm sure um, the committee would not want to um, stop community groups and business groups and areas um, from putting forward um, their their own vision. Um, uh, convener, uh, to conclude, um, there is a considerable and growing support for planning to actively enable the delivery of high quality development. Master plan consent areas will be an important tool in the box for achieving that. Uh, this part of the bill has been carefully designed uh, and we've been working with authorities to fully test it out. And I would ask the committee to reject amendments that will undermine our good work on this important area. But in saying that, I am more than willing uh, to have further discussions uh, with people around about aspects of this area of the bill. Thank you, Minister. And the uh, Whiteman to wind up. Uh, thank you, <coughs> uh, Convener. Um, I welcome the observations of, of the uh, Minister. I think the concerns that some of us had at stage one was that master plan consent areas um, confer, uh, or the process by which they could be applied for, confer wide powers which <laughs> could very, very easily pass planning authorities and give a lot of power uh, to ministers. Uh, to influence uh, development against the wishes of planning authorities. I think that's where some of the concerns uh, came from. And I, I do want to respond to the Minister's um, arguments about um, places like Hillingdon or Chambers of Commerce or, or community groups. No, nothing in these amendments prevents any party, including my sister in Switzerland, advocating or requesting, suggesting, publicly campaigning for, tabling motions, in local authorities to have master plan consent areas. Uh, indeed, I, I think they're a very useful mechanism and I think that potentially many people should argue for them. All they do is remove the statutory right to have that um, application. Um, I certainly want us to be moving over time to a more public-led model of development planning 
rather than the system where we have at the moment, which is dominated uh, by private interests. I'm content to revisit some of these amendments, and I also want to um, say that I listened carefully to what the Minister had to say, and in light of his comments, will not be pressing amendments 93, 96, or 97. I think he gave some cogent reasons why those provisions um, are in the bill. I listened to what Graham Simpson had to say as well. Uh, I still support Amendment 14. I think it's, these should only be introduced by planning authorities. Uh, but I also agree with Graham Simpson that we could, could perhaps have some further discussions um, to widen that out uh, before stage three. Thank you. So can I just clarify there, Andy, then, that you'll be withdrawing Amendment 93? I saw I'm withdrawing 93 and shall not be moving 96 and 97. Thank you very much. Uh, Andy Whiteman wishes to withdraw uh, the Amendment 93. Does any member present object to this amendment being withdrawn? Thank you. The amendment is therefore withdrawn. OK. So, um, Okay, I call Amendment 56 in the name of Alexander Stewart, already debated with Amendment 55. Alexander Stewart, to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 56 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Okay, those in favour of Amendment 56? Four. Those opposed? Three. Uh, amendment 56 is agreed to. I call Amendment 14 in the name of Graham Simpson, already debated with Amendment 93. And I remind members that Amendment 14 preempts Amendment 252. Graham Simpson to move or not move? Move. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 14 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Those in favour of Amendment 14? Four. Those opposed? Three. Uh, the amendment is agreed to. I call Amendment 302 in the name of Monica Lennon, already debated with Amendment 93. Monica Lennon to move or not move? Not move. Thank you. I call Amendment 94 in the name of Andy Whiteman, already debated with Amendment 93. Andy Whiteman to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 94 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Those in favour? Four. Those opposed? Three. 94 is therefore agreed to. I call Amendment 303 in the name of Monica Lennon, already debated with Amendment 93. And I remind members that Amendment 303 preempts Amendments 293 and 253. Monica Lennon to move or not move? Not move. Thank you. Hmm? I call Amendment 293 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 241. Minister, to move formally. Uh, moved, Convener. Thank you. Question is that Amendment 293 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The amendment 293 is therefore agreed to. I call amendment 253 in the name of the Minister, already debated with amendment 232. Minister to move Moved, Convener. The question is that amendment 253 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Amendments agreed. Call amendment 95 in the name of Andy Whiteman, already debated with amendment 93. Remind members that amendment 95 preempts amendment 57. Andy Whiteman to move or not move? Moved. The question is that amendment 95 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Those agreed? Four. Those opposed? Three. The Amendment 95 is agreed to. I call Six. Amendment 96 in the name of Andy Whiteman, already debated with Amendment 93. And remind members that Amendment 96 preempts Amendments 254 and 255. Andy Whiteman to move or not move? No. Not moved. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for your support, Annabelle. <laughs> uh, uh, amendment 96 has not been moved. Uh, yeah, right. Call Amendment 254 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 232. Minister to move. Moved, Thank you. The question is that Amendment 254 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Amendment 254 is therefore agreed to. I call Amendment 255 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 232. Minister to move. Uh, moved, Convener. The question is that Amendment 255 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Um, amendments agreed. Uh, call Amendment 97 in the name of Andy Whiteman, already debated with Amendment 93. Andy Whiteman to move or not move? Uh, not moved. Uh, thank you. 
The amendment's not moved. Call amendment 304 in the name of Monica Lennon, already debated with amendment 93, and I remind members that amendment 304 preempts amendment 256. Monica Lennon to move or not move? Not moved. Thank you. Right, uh, 256. Yep. I call amendment 256 in the name of the minister, already debated with amendment 93. Minister? Uh, moved, convener. Thank you. The question is amendment 256 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Okay. Therefore, the question is that section 10 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Right. Thank you. The question is that section 11 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Right. I call amendment 305 in the name of Lewis MacDonald, already debated with amendment 2. Uh, welcome Lewis to the meeting and ask him to move or not move. Moved. Thank you. The question is that amendment 305 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Those in favour of amendment 305? It's four. Those opposed? That's three. The amendment is agreed to. And I think this may be an appropriate time to have a very brief break. Uh, so if we can make it five minutes and come back, that'd be great. Thank you.
I call Amendment 43 in the name of Andy Whiteman, grouped with Amendments 44, 45 and 140. Andy Whiteman to move Amendment 43 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, convener. Um, <clears throat> Section 10.2e of the Town County Planning Scotland Act 1947 provided that the use of land for agriculture, and this is me talking to Amendment 43, which um, I move in my name, uh, provided that use of land for agriculture and forestry and the use for those purposes occupied together with such land did not constitute development, and that exception was restated in Section 26.2e of the 97 Act. Amendment 43 removes this exception and brings agricultural land use and forestry land use into the planning system by classifying such uses as development for the purposes of planning law. There's a number of reasons why I think this is right that this be done. Section 57 of the Climate Change Scotland Act 2009 introduces the duty on ministers to prepare a land use strategy. Work on this is still ongoing, but as a strategy that is spatial and covers rural land, it's self-evident that such a strategy be part of the planning system in order to provide democratically accountable decisions to be made about two important land uses that cover extensive areas of land. It's worth noting that the impact of this will be minimal as far as agricultural land is concerned, since virtually no new land is coming into agricultural use that would constitute development. However, by bringing agriculture firmly within the planning system will allow for more coherent spatial planning in relation to hydrology, flood control, soil and vegetation management, and the protection of vital areas for food growing. In relation to forestry, this is clearly a land use that is expanding, and the impact of this change will be most keenly felt in this sector. Currently, Scottish planning policy provides for local forestry and woodland strategies in the form of supplementary guidance, and indeed Highland Council have been consulting this year on their latest such strategy. Given that forestry development has important implications for landscape, road infrastructure, hydrology, industry, employment, etc., it should be governed by the planning system rather than as a present by a government department, the Forestry Commission, operating outside the spatial planning system. I move Amendment 43 in my name, which I think I've already done. Thank you. You have, but... Um, amendment 44, 45. Introduce into primary legislation a definition of what constitutes a change of use in relation to a dwelling house that is intended to be used as a holiday home, that's Amendment 44, or a short-term let, Amendment 45. Currently, either of these two changes of use might constitute a change of use, according to the land use class orders, depending on the circumstances. Amendment 44 seeks to bring holiday or second homes, as they're also known, into the planning system. The Scottish Government defines such premises for council tax purposes as homes occupied for at least 25 days per year and not being the main residence of the owner, Scottish Statutory Instrument 2013-45. This means that those properties are only being occupied for specific times of the year, with the majority of the time being left vacant. Data published by the National Records of Scotland, published in May this year, indicate there are 25,713 holiday homes in Scotland, although the true figure could be much higher, as it's been reported and it is known that owners are increasingly reclassifying properties as commercial holiday lets in order to take advantage of taxation loopholes, most notably the small business bonus scheme. And indeed, some councils such as the City of Edinburgh and Western Barton no longer record how many second homes there are in their localities because of this complication. The impact of second homes on local housing markets has been a long-standing issue in rural Scotland. It remains a serious problem in areas such as Applecross, Arran and the East Nuke of Fife, for example. In the neighbouring data zones of Ely and Earls Ferry, out of a total of 937 dwellings, 422 or 45% of these properties are second homes. And my understanding is that the local school has closed as a consequence. None of this, none of this has been governed by any planning decision made by a democratic planning authority. Over the summer, I conducted a consultation on this amendment, which received responses from residents, industry and planning authorities. The Cairngorms National Park, for example, pointed to one of their publications, which called second homes, I quote, problematic and, I quote, ineffective stock. Amendment 44 ensures that where a property is currently used as a main home and there's an intention to change this use to anything else, including use as a holiday home, this proposal cannot be given effect to without any consider of the po consideration of the possible impacts on local housing markets and availability. This will allow planning authorities to regulate the use of domestic property to ensure the most appropriate balance between homes for local people and holiday homes for external interests. Turning now to Amendment 45. Amendment 45 to seeks to provide a clearer and simpler definition of what constitutes a change of use 
from a domestic dwelling to a short-term let. As members may be aware, I've been working on this topic for over a year in response to widespread concerns over the rapid growth in homes used not for home sharing, where the owner rents out a room or two or perhaps even a whole property for a few weeks, but still remains their home, that's historically been taking in lodgers, not concerns about that, but concern about commercial lets, where the property ceases to be a domestic dwelling and is converted into a commercial property let out for short periods of time, typically on global online platforms. Currently, short-term lets are not included in the Town Country Planning Use Class Scotland's Order 1997. Class 7 covers hotels and hostels, but does not include short-term lets. This means that the use is sui generis, or otherwise a in a class of its own, and that any proposal to change the use of a Class 9 use, which is houses used as main or sole residences, to a short-term let, is, on paper, a change of use requiring consent. However, currently, such a change of use has to be material before any consent is required. And the principal means of assessing materiality in Edinburgh and elsewhere has been to take account of the intensity and frequency of use by visitors. For example, an application for a certificate of lawfulness for a short-term let operating in South Queensbury without consent was refused on the basis that the intensity and frequency of use exceeded 30% of the year. That and many other applications in Edinburgh have been upheld on appeal uh, by the reporter. However, such assessments are incredibly time-consuming, and to undertake and rely typically on neighbours documenting the comings and goings of visitors and submitting this as evidence of a breach of planning is hugely disproportionate. In addition, the current planning provisions are open to legal challenge. One case that was planned to be brought before the Court of Session by a woman who lives in California and uses her property in Edinburgh as a short-term let has been dropped, but others are in the pipeline. What is required is a straightforward definition in planning law as to what constitutes a change of use from a dwelling house to a short-term let. And the key issue here is the distinction between a property used as a permanent home, a sole or main residence, a place for a family to live, and on the other hand, as a commercial short-term letting property. Amendment 45 puts that distinction into law. The purpose of this amendment is not to prescribe the number and locations of short-term lets. That's a matter for planning authorities through their development plans and development control. Amendment 45 will allow them to develop policy and implement development control in a more effective and meaningful manner, however. Finally, I would note that a number of detailed issues have been raised in consultation responses I received uh, on this. Again, I will be publishing these, and I shall be seeking to address these between now and stage three. I invite members to support amendments 43, 44 and 45. Thank you very much. Uh, and Claudia Beamish to speak to amendment 140 and other amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, convener, and good morning to you, committee and uh, minister. Um, amendment uh, 140 and in the later groups 10 and 12, the consequential amendments of 141 and 142 were initially submitted by myself to protect areas of flood risk from agricultural permitted development rights, which can proceed without a full uh, planning application. An example of this in my own region saw permitted development rights used to ultimately develop housing on a floodplain. Land was raised under permitted development rights on a floodplain for the purposes of an agricultural shed. Although SEPA had concerns over this, they had no re remit um, to, to give them the permitted development rights status. The changes made the issue of the floodplain um, a, a, a serious concern, and, sub and th this unfortunately led um, by the developer to a subsequent successful application for housing, housing which had previously been declined. SEPA voiced their concerns over the application given the history of the site. However, the decline by the local authority was overruled uh, by the Scottish Government Inquiry Reporter. The reporter concluded that as the land had been raised and was now out of the floodplain, it should not have been rejected. Um, I do believe that this is a, a, a concerning loophole in the law as it stands. 
While I would stress that the developer was adhering to the planning process and did not breach it with the application for housing, it created tremendous anxiety and resentment within the community who were perplexed by a system that appeared not to be able to protect them. Only two years ago, we saw unprecedented destruction from flooding across the country due to adverse weather conditions, and the likelihood of this recurring increases with the climate change challenge that, challenges that we face. It is therefore vital that we protect our floodplains and have legislation in place to do so. This means future proofing. However, following discussions with the Scottish Government and with SEPA, I'm considering withdrawing these amendments uh, and I understand that work is already underway looking at extending permitted development rights. I note that in the Sustainability Appraisal, Sco uh, appraisal Scoping Report, the removal of permitted development rights from areas of flood risk has been highlighted as an area for consideration. And I'm reassured that SEPA will be engaging further on this issue. That said, I'm also um, hopeful of seeking reassurance from the Minister today that this is the case and that he will also consider uh, this issue within the National Planning Framework and the National Policy Review. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Minister? Uh, convener, um, as we move into this part of the bill uh, dealing with development management and at the risk of sounding a bit like a stuck record, um, I'd like to take a wee moment to reiterate the government's purpose in bringing forward this bill. Um, the aim is to streamline the planning system uh, and remove unnecessary process for both planning authorities and applicants so that resources can be focused on creating uh, great places and delivering the de development uh, our communities need. Uh, there was very little in the bill as introduced on development management, um, and this is because the independent panel did not find any major changes needed in this area. Decisions are made mainly by local planning authorities, uh, led by the development plan, but also taking into account the material considerations that may be relevant to each case. Uh, planning authorities have substantial flexibility uh, in their ability to request additional information from the applicant, uh, consider the individual local circumstances that apply in each case, and impose conditions on the development if that seems necessary. There are practical issues we need to address through training and guidance and improvements in technology, uh, but we don't propose to change the basic system. The flexibility for planning authorities to consider what is relevant in each case is essential, given the wide range of issues the planning system deals with and the different cir circumstances that apply in each case. I recognise that many of the amendments that have been put forward seek to address important issues, uh, but a blanket requirement in primary legislation is not always the best solution. Uh, this committee has agreed that in future, uh, policies should be uh, an integral part uh, of the development plan through both the national planning framework and the local development plan. That gives uh, a, a policy additional weight and scrutiny while still allowing planning authorities uh, to decide which policies are relevant in individual cases. Uh, members have said that they do not want the bill to be centralising, uh, but many of these amendments would limit authorities' ability to deal with applications in a way that suits their local and individual circumstances and to balance the various issues involved to make the best decision in the overall public interest. Blanket statutory requirements also run the risk of imposing additional costs and delays in cases where they are not necessary. Uh, while the impacts of individual amendments may be small, uh, I would ask members of the committee uh, to consider the cumulative impact of all of the amendments that have been put forward here. Uh, the first group of amendments uh, relates to the meaning of development what does or does not require planning permission, essentially section 26.1 of the 1997 Act provides that building and engineering operations or any material change of use are development uh, which requires planning permission. 
Section 26.2 excludes certain things from that, such as works that only affect the interior of a building, ordinary use of a house and garden, and maintenance of roads, sewers, water pipes, and so on. Andy Whiteman's uh, Amendment 43 uh, seeks to remove the exclusion for the use of land for forestry or agriculture so that any material change of use for such purposes would require planning permission. It's not clear what the implications of this change would be, uh, what sort of changes of use in relation to agriculture and forestry might be considered to be material and so require planning per permission before they can be carried out. It would certainly have a significant impact on these sectors and the rural econ economy that they are part of, as well as on, as on planning authorities. Even where planning permission was not required, uh, people would need to stop and consider it and would perhaps request a certificate of lawful use or development just to be sure. All of this would introduce delays and costs to business and regulators. Some of the activities that would be brought into the planning system by this amendment are already regulated by other means. Uh, environmental impact assessment regulations apply to proposals to carry out a range of agricultural operations and woodland creation projects where the result would have a significant impact on the environment. The legislative framework covering the regulation of forestry in Scotland is of course in the process of being modernised and forestry will be fully devolved um, to the Scottish Ministers from April of next year. The updated regulatory regime has been consulted on widely and is expected to work uh, effectively for landowners, local communities and consultees. It includes well-developed develop procedures for preparing and assessing, assessing forestry projects such as woodland creation, felling and restocking against internationally recognised sustainable forest management criteria. Irrigation, which would be brought into the definition of development by the removal of section 26.2a, is subject to control under other environmental regulations managed by SEPA. On the other hand, removing the clarification in subsection 2a that drainage and water management projects are development and therefore currently subject to planning controls could lead to some of these act those activities being left unregulated. Overall, I'm concerned that this amendment would unravel an interlocking system of regulation, resulting in possible duplication and adding unnecessary burdens and confusion. If I could turn to Claudia Beamish's uh, Amendment 140, uh, which would require planning permission for any of the operations and activities which are currently exempt from planning control where certain flood risk is, uh, criteria were met. Uh, the criteria themselves are not necessarily clear-cut, as uh, Ms uh, Beamish has found in our discussion with our officials. Uh, and it's not obvious how the person carrying out an activity would obtain the planning authority's uh, opinion first. The wording is taken from the Flood Risk Management Scotland Act, but it relates to mapping and assessment at a strategic level and is not intended to be used in the planning system. The final clause is particularly broad. It applies to anything that affects those features, even if it improves them and could impact on clearing vegetation, even in gardens or on road verges. And I'm aware um, of some of the concerns about activities which are already classed as development, uh, but which are granted uh, planning permission by permitted development rights, uh, such as excavations and engineering operations for agriculture. Uh, what benefits from permitted development rights is, however, a separate matter from the de definition of development uh, and would be unaffected by this amendment. SEPA and local authority flooding officers already have uh, a significantly and highly technical role within the planning system. Flooding is a material consideration and flood risk is considered fully through the system. 
Reducing flood risk is a priority um, for the Scottish Government uh, and we will be working through National Planning Framework 4 and Scottish Planning Policy in due course and will consider in discussion with SEPA and others whether any changes need to be brought forward to strengthen policy in relation to development in areas of flood risk. Uh, we will also be reviewing permitted development rights after the bill and I ask Claudia Beamish not to press her amendment and I will be happy to include her in those discussions um, when the time comes. Uh, turning to amendments 44 and 45, uh, I share Mr Whiteman's concern about the availability of homes in popular tourist areas. Uh, this government has taken a number of measures uh, to encourage the use of existing properties as main residences allowing local authorities to remove council tax, tax discounts on second homes and supporting the work of Scotland's Empty Homes Partnership, which tackles the wide range of reasons a property may be empty and helps to provide case-by-case -case solutions for people. We also introduced the Land and Buildings Transaction uh, Tax Additional Dwelling Supplement in April 2016 which has made it more expensive uh, to purchase second homes in Scotland. I'm also, uh, of course, aware of the concerns in parts of the country, and particularly in Edinburgh, about the effects on long-term communities of houses and flats being used for short-term letting. Uh, we need to consider how we can address these concerns whilst not undermining the economic benefits of tourism, particularly in areas uh, that wants to increase holiday accommodation. So I'm very sympathetic uh, to the intention behind these amendments. However, there are some significant difficulties with the wording that means I cannot support them in their current form. I hope Mr Whiteman will be open to further discussion uh, before stage three to see if we can resolve uh, some of these issues. Principally, uh, the types of accommodation which are to be controlled by these amendments are not clearly defined. There is provision uh, for ministers to issue guidance, uh, but that does not allow us to refine what would require planning permission. Interpretation of legislation is a matter for the courts. Clearly, uh, what is a, a holiday home or second home or a short-term late does require detailed consideration of how long or how often or in what circumstances a property needs to be used to fall into these categories. If someone is working on an extended contract in another part of the country in rented accommodation, would one or other of the properties constitute a second home? If someone is staying in a short term late on a business trip, is that different from a holiday late? I wonder if a provision for regulations uh, might help to clarify those issues rather than guidance. Amendment 44 would change the definition of development to include any change in the use of a sole or main residence that changes its purpose, although it refers in particular to use as a holiday home or second home, that does not exclude other changes in purpose. It is not clear, for example, whether that would include secondary uses such as turning one room into an office or childminding facility, which currently do not necessarily require planning permission. And this needs to be clarified. Amendment 45 would exclude letting property, which is the sole or main residence of the landlord and residential, and residential leases from being considered short-term lets. However, under Amendment 44, these might be considered to change the purpose of the dwelling, which would make those exemptions irrelevant. We must also be conscious of the implications of addressing these problems through planning legislation. Firstly, they would apply across Scotland, uh, requiring additional planning applications in areas that want to increase holiday accommodation as well as those that see a need to control it. Secondly, 
creating a requirement for planning permission does not translate into being able to refuse permission if there are no material planning considerations involved. And it is not clear whether a change in how a dwelling is occupied would be a material consideration in all cases. Robust development plan policies would also be needed to ensure any decisions on applications could withstand challenge. Thirdly, neither amendment would affect existing second homes or short-term lets. Although owners may want to apply for certi certificates of lawful use to establish the planning status of their property, it may even create a premium price for existing properties in some areas, making it even harder to bring them back into use as a main residence. Fourthly, planning permission is a one-off decision uh, and would not address the various concerns that have been expressed in relation to the management of short-term letting, such as health and safety and antisocial behaviour issues. Andy Whiteman has written to me uh, jointly with Alex Cole Hamilton, Ruth Davidson and Kezia Dugdale uh, calling for the extension of licensing controls to short-term letting. In our exchanges uh, and our recent parliamentary question, he sought clarification on whether any such licensing scheme would give all local authorities powers and allow them to decide whether to develop their own schemes or choose to have no scheme in line with local needs. That degree of local flexibility on the need for control would not apply with a national requirement for planning permission. We have made a commitment as a government in the programme for government uh, to consider this matter further, look at what the evidence tells us and to ensure that local authorities have the appropriate powers to manage short-term letting. To this end, we have set up uh, a short-term let's delivery group of officials from across government. As I've said, I cannot accept these amendments in their current form, but I am happy to work with Mr Whiteman in, a, in advance of stage three to see what we can bring forward to enable the planning system to contribute to addressing uh, the problems. I would ask the committee not to support the amendments in this group and thank you for your forbearance, convener, uh, but I had to address a, a number of technical issues there. Thank you very much, Minister. Uh, Andy Whiteman to... Oh, oh sorry, Graham, my apologies. Thank, thanks, convener. Um, <clears throat> I will try to be brief, but these, uh, this, this is an important uh, group. Um, if I can, uh, first of all, address uh, Andy Whiteman's uh, Amendment 43, um, which seeks to bring agriculture and uh, forestry within the meaning of development. Um, the committee's heard, it's had correspondence from the National Farmers Union Scotland on this. Uh, their strong view is that it would be wholly impractical for farmers when going about their everyday business. And they actually go on, they went on to say it would introduce a vast burden for local authorities and potentially jeopardise food production. Uh, in Scotland. They're, they're strong words, convener, uh, and I'm pretty sure Andy Whiteman wouldn't wish to jeopardise uh, food production. Um, now, uh, uh, as the Minister said, this could have a, a significant uh, impact on agriculture. So, um, to cut to the chase, uh, we will not be supporting uh, that uh, amendment. Um, if I can turn to Andy Whiteman's amendments 44 uh, and 45, um, which are slightly different. Uh, Amendment 44 says it should be regarded as a change of use requiring planning permission if a property stops being used as someone's main home and is used for, quote, any other purpose, with ministers issuing guidance on what's meant by that. But as the minister uh, himself has said, that could include, you know, something like, uh, using a home as a uh, child mining business or, or any other business uh, for that matter. So we think, um, yeah, that's far too wide, far too vague, far too open to interpretation. Um, and so we'll not be supporting that amendment. Now, Amendment 45 is slightly different. It homes in specifically on people's homes being let out as short term holiday lets. We've got to be, we do have to be careful. The self-catering sector is very important. It generates 
723 million pounds a year in economic activity in Scotland and supports 15,000 full-time jobs. Um, but it must surely be right that the local council uh, can control things and can protect areas from losing their identity and their, their desirability as places to live permanently. Um, we have to recognise there have been concerns in parts of the country over this, but particularly in, in Edinburgh. We think at this point that Amendment 45 can be supported, uh, but I would say to anyone in the sector who has misgivings to carry on talking to us. Uh, if changes are needed for Stage 3, we'll look at them. Um, and I, I hear the words uh, of the Minister that he is uh, open to discussions around this. Uh, I would en encourage him to uh, uh, move forward with that offer uh, and talk to everyone. Um, I'm reassured um, by Claudia Beamish um, signalling her intent to perhaps withdraw Amendment 140, which deals with flooding. I can see where she's coming from, uh, but I do feel the uh, amendment as currently drafted uh, is, is too widely drafted for us to support at this stage. So hopefully she will withdraw that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, before I let uh, Monica line in, uh, I looked round at the appropriate time to ask if members wanted to get in. And nobody was indicating that they did. So in future, can we just make sure that before the minister or the last speaker responds that you draw, uh, you catch my eye, uh, Monica? You're very fair, even it's hard to catch your eye when we're sitting side by side. But I will be very, well, very get, brief. <laughs> I will be very brief. Um, so, Amendment 43, um, I think, would represent a major shift in where decision-making power lies when it comes to forestry. Um, however, I don't believe that this shift would be without its merits. Um, however, I'd like more time to speak to colleagues and other stakeholders on this change. So um, I haven't abstained on any vote yet with this bill, but I will abstain today. Um, I'd like to speak to Andy Whiteman further um, about that amendment. I think the Minister made some really valid points on um, Amendment 44. Um, it takes me back to my development management days and reminds me, convener, I should have declared my um, register of interest as a member of the Royal Town Planning Institute. So I think there could be unintended consequence of 43. It needs a bit more work, so I'm not going to support that. And uh, in contrast, I mean, 45 is more tightly drawn, so I'll probably echo some of um, and, uh, Graham Simpson's remarks. So I will support 45 today. Convener. Thank you very much. Uh, and now, Andy Whiteman, could you wind up? Thank you very much, uh, Convener. <clears throat> um, to cut to the chase, I'll be withdrawing Amendment 43 when it comes to the vote, and I will not be moving Amendment 44. Um, the, the Minister talked about some places wanting to control, i.e. limit, and some places wanting to increase um, short-term lets, and that's precisely what the planning system is there to do, to provide planning authorities with the means to regulate the use of land and property in the way that they <coughs> see fit. And the, the essence of 45 is to draw a distinction between property that is a home, that is someone's main home, and property that is no longer a main home. That, that seems to me to be a legitimate and, and very, very valid distinction between two very separate uses. Now, as I indicated in my opening remarks... Yes? Uh, my main difficulty um, with your Amendment 45 is around about the definition. Uh, which is not within that amendment. Uh, and I'm, as I say, more than happy uh, to have further discussions with you uh, and with other members uh, to see how we can deal with this. Um, but I cannot support um, an amendment at this moment in time uh, which is not uh, giving uh, the full uh, story and the uh, all of the information that is required. So I'm more than happy to have the discussions uh, with Mr Whiteman, convener, and with any other member around about this to get this right, but I'm not happy to support Amendment 45 at this moment. I, I understand that, and um, there, there, is, there is drafting in 45. I indicated that in my opening remarks, that there's drafting work uh, to, be, to, to, to be done. Um, and as I say, the key distinction here is between a solo main residence, which is language that appears in 44, but doesn't appear in 45, I, I, I concede that, uh, and property that's not. 
Um, now, we have planning authorities right across the country who are being deciding or determining applications to build self-catering accommodation. Um, I can give you any number of them during the course of my uh, research. Typically, these consents are granted because people want to support the tourism economy, and typically such consents prohibit the use of such property as a sole or main residence. So planning authorities are not unused to doing this kind of regulation. What we have, the problem we have in terms of short-term commercial lets, and per per particularly the conversion of existing homes, existing ones, to commercial letting where it's no longer somebody's home. The problem we have is that the materiality of that change is currently being um, uh, assessed on the basis of intensity and frequency of use, which is a, a virtually, virtually impossible uh, task to do. Notwithstanding that, Edinburgh has over 100 enforcement actions out on those grounds, but it's not uh, easy. So, uh, and on the Minister's point about regulation, I, 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 I noted, obviously, in the programme for government, the commitment to bring forward or to explore licensing powers. And I just want to be clear about the distinction between licensing and planning. For example, in the Licensing Scotland Act 2005 on alcohol premises, the first condition one has to satisfy in that legislation if one's applying for a license is that the premises from which one intends to conduct that activity of selling alcohol has got planning permission for that purpose. That, that's the first test you have to satisfy. And similarly, for short-term lets, I would envisage a licensing process that's designed to ensure standards are adhered to in fire and safety and gas safety checks and all the rest of it, I would envisage circumstances in which those licences could only be granted to premises that had planning consent for that use. And I reiterate, the current means by which that planning consent is being granted is on a very difficult, time-consuming uh, means by which uh, intensity and frequency uh, of use is, um, is the key cri criteria. I will be pressing Amendment 45, um, I want to get this onto the bill, and I want to say in unambiguous terms to the Minister that I very much welcome sitting down with him at the earliest possible opportunity to make sure we bring greater clarity within the planning system on what constitutes a change of use uh, in this field, because I think it is the necessary precondition to any licensing scheme that might be brought forward. If it's not, the danger of any licensing scheme is that a licensing, a licensing process being quasi-judicial and having limited discretionary grounds for refusal, one may very well find that a licence is granted for a short-term let in circumstances where this is introduced, but the property from which that activity is planned to be um, carried out does not have planning consent. And that seems to me a, a, a bizarre state of affairs. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Andy. Uh, so will you be pressing or withdrawing? Which one? 43. I will be withdrawing 45, not... Moving 43. 43. 43. No, you're not. 43. I'm withdrawing 43. Your secretary's making sure that you've been done accordingly. I'm withdrawing 43, <laughs> not moving 44, and I am moving 45. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Andy Wayman wishes to withdraw his amendment 43. Uh, does any member present object to this amendment being withdrawn? Thank you. Therefore, that amendment is withdrawing. Uh, I call Amendment 44 in the name of Andy Whiteman, already debated with Amendment 43. Move or not move, Andy? Uh, not move. Thank you. Uh, and Amendment 45 in the name of Andy Whiteman, already debated with Amendment 43. Move or not move? Move. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 45 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Uh, those in favour? Four. Those opposed? The, the amendment is passed. I call Amendment 140 in the name of Claudia Beamish, already debated with Amendment 43. Claudia Beamish to move or not move? Not move. Thank you. The question is, therefore, that Section 12 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. I call Amendment yes, 207 in the name of Pauline McNeill, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. I notice that Pauline's not here. Has she made any um, indication? She doesn't plan to move it, so... Right, OK. Right. Uh, Claudia Beamish to speak to Amendment 228 and other amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, this amendment is in the same vein as my Amendment um, 220, which did not pass, which members will recall was to establish a low-carbon infrastructure commission with responsibility for establishing national infrastructure needs assessments. 
Amendment 228 places an additional requirement on applications for planning permission for a national or major development. It would require developers to include a national infrastructure needs assessment within the meaning referred to in 220. But this amendment does stand in its own right, so I'm going to um, explore it briefly today um, with, with members' forbearance. As the more substantive amendment um, did not pass, I will not press this amendment today, however, but I would reiterate that there is a high level, um, a high level of investment. When there is a high level of investment in a development, it should last for a considerable distance into the future, and it is vital that these developments are in line with a low-carbon future. In view of the International Panel on Climate Change report on the need for emissions to be below 1.5, this is now even more of an imperative. We must not build any infrastructure which will need retrofitting or become quickly out of date. I would welcome any comment on 228 in this context, um, and I would uh, consider bringing forward something at stage three, um, if this is appropriate, to ensure we design infrastructure and major developments which are appropriately future-proofed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, John Finney to speak to Amendment 229 and other amendments in the group. Um, thank you, Convener. I will restrict my comments to uh, this particular amendment, which is about um, inserting um, a, a, a con further consideration into um, the Town and Country Planning Act 1997 after Section 32. And that would involve uh, an instance where an application for planning permission is made by a local authority or a health board. The application must include evidence that matters of population growth and population projection have been considered in relation to the development to which the application applies. And that would be an evidenced position, and that evidence could indeed be drawn by the local development plan and the local housing strategy. Now, I will give uh, examples of where I think this, uh, had it been in place, would have helped, for instance, um, uh, and, and I'll spare the authority of the blushes, but if, for instance, a primary school were constructed and on day one it was found to be uh, grossly inadequate to the needs of the population, then that will result in additional costs, additional disturbance in the neighbour, um, um, a further build. Um, similarly, with health authorities, I, I think particularly with challenges in rural areas, um, understanding population and the impact that can have can affect um, capital building programmes too. Longer term, things like the relationships between housing and employment, this could have a factor on, and strange though it may seem, we'll come to it at a future date, issue of demolition of property would be, uh, could be uh, covered by this too. Um, particularly if, like me, you want to see areas that were previously populated, repopulated, like many Highland Glens and other rural areas. So, um, uh, the Minister in a previous intervention encouraged us to stop and consider. Well, I, I, I would hope that issues of population and population growth should be uh, considered a material fact, and I hope members will support this amendment. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, John. Uh, Monica Lennon to speak to Amendment 113 and other amendments. Thank you, Convener. Um, 113 in my name. Um, would require ministers to bring forward regulations um, about the, the, the types of um, health impact that would have to be considered. So it's basically about making sure that there are health impact assessments for major and national developments. I've had a whole sort of package of amendments uh, to this bill which are health related um, and that's because planning has the ability to um, impact and also transform our physical and mental health. Um, some of the things that could make it into a health impact assessment um, could be um, housing quality, um, access to natural environment, pollution, walking, cycling routes, car dependency. I'm sorry, was someone wanting to take... No, no, sorry, I was getting distracted there. Um, so, yes, yeah, to bring into sharp focus um, the, the positive and negative impacts that development and planning decisions can have on health. So it's another toolkit available to planning decision makers. Um, I do believe it's proportionate because it would only apply to national and major developments, which are of a scale that's likely to have potential impact on significant numbers of people. Um, convener Daniel Johnson um, isn't able to be here, so I'll also move Amendment 307 in Daniel's name. And that would ensure that MSPs, MPs and councillors in a locality must be informed when a major 
development application is made in their constituency and I think that's quite straightforward and, and to be commended. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Alec Rowley to speak to Amendment 114. Thank you, Convener. Um, this amendment aims to bring about greater information and transparency on the impact of a development on the capacity of local public services. I believe that this is uh, an issue, I certainly have experience in Fife, but I believe it's an issue across Scotland. Um, and so, so there is a requirement on the developer to consult with public authorities and bring forward as part of the application a report that sets out what the impact would be or the potential effects on capacity. And the amendment also then means that local authorities would have to take that into consideration when determining a planning application and would be able to take the opportunity uh, through the Section 575 planning obligation to negotiate that. I thought there was, there was a note that, that came around uh, yesterday, last evening, from Homes for Scotland, which I actually thought was helpful, uh, although it was it was um, in opposition to this amendment. But I think it was helpful in the sense that what it states is that it's important to anticipate and plan for the infrastructure needs of Scotland's growing population. I think we would all absolutely agree with that. It then says, but Alec Rowley's amendment 114 seems to support the unsustainable tenant that those who build new homes should be responsible for their customers' other needs. Now, there is, there is, I would argue, a responsibility both in terms of the developer but also in terms of the, the planning authority that if you, for example, are building X amount of family homes for children, then there is a responsibility to to say that there should be the education facilities in place in those local communities for those children. That does not necessarily mean that it is the responsibility of the developer to then pay for a new school. But the developer may have a responsibility if that puts pressure on the capacity within a school to ensure that there is the additional classroom, for example. So, so, so there is, there is, yeah. Um, uh, this is an interesting potential amendment. I mean, it, it's modelled on the environmental impact assessments that are required in certain instances. And one of the problems with environmental impact assessments, particularly for major developments, is that they are drawn up and paid for by the applicant and are frequently found to be uh, deficient. Indeed, there's a strong argument for taking it out of the hands of applicants when it's something as important as environmental impact assessments. The danger, presumably, is that if the applicant has to prepare a report uh, about a proposal that would impact on education, health, leisure facilities, they'll be motivated to try and minimise uh, those impacts. Um, surely look, planning authorities at the moment have provision in planning laws that stands, Section 75 agreements, etc., to ensure that any consequential other services that need to be upgraded can be upgraded. Indeed, I'm aware of many planning determinations that have been made that are sitting there on hold awaiting the construction of a new school or a new GP surgery. So I'm just kind of wondering what the added value of, of requiring the applicant to prepare this report would be. OK. And I think, I think the next point for Homes for Scotland feeds into, into your point. Applicants, in any case, have no hope of being able to prepare this information in the absence of information from public authorities. So the responsibility would be on the applicant to... Um, to, to um, that have dialogue with the public authorities so that the public authorities would need to respond uh, and say what the, the implications of that development would be. And if you take an example where, 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 where I actually live uh, in the village of Kelty at the, the current time, the um, local development plan set out for a development in 900 houses there was no input NHS 5 were consulted. There was no input for NHS 5, and there is no mention within that, that, that proposal that it will have any impact on local NHS services. And yet the local health centre 
has repeatedly written now to the Planning Authority and objected to the application on the basis that if this, this development goes ahead, they would not have the capacity within the existing health centre, within the building itself, the physical building, to be able to uh, to be able to take people from that development or people moving into the village onto their books. And they've been quite clear they would have to close their list. Not, not in terms of just simply a GP, but being able to provide the, 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 the rounded medical services that would be required to service 900 homes. And in discussion with the, 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 the developer, the developer has actually agreed to make a contribution, but then in discussion with the planners, the head of planning in Fife, their response was that that could not be linked to a Section 75 agreement because the NHS Fife had never identified at the local plan stage that there was a health need that would go with those 900 houses. So, so the point I'm making is that by putting the responsibility onto the applicant to consult with the local public authorities, you would bring about a greater transparency because those local health authority or whatever the authority is would have to respond. Uh, and if they did not respond, when it came to the application stage, it would be clear that they had not responded. Um, so, so the responsibility uh, in terms of taking it to the next stage sits with the, the authority as well as with the applicant. They also go on Homes for Scotland, which is, a, a, I think, another impressive point. At present, the ability of those authorities to provide this information or to calculate it in a way that is reliable and proportionate is not where it should be. So Homes for Scotland, the representatives of developers are saying that, that the authorities and their ability to actually calculate that information at the current time is not where it should be. Now, that needs to be addressed. Um, and, and, and as part of a requirement, putting the information, uh, putting the, inform the onus for the developer, for the health authority or whatever other authority to respond, would mean that that information would need to be brought forward. They also say infrastructure requirements of planned development, both shown on maps and as required by the wider policies and targets, should be anticipated years ahead of the application stage by the public authorities responsible for meeting the need of society. Well, that, that is not happening, and there's nowhere in here that, 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 that in, in the current legislation that, 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 that suggests that that should take place. An intervention. I think that's been a, that's been a really helpful exchange. It just strikes me that um, for major planning applications, which this talks about major development, there's already a requirement to do early consultation with stakeholders and communities. And the type of questions members of the public ask when they come along to those events, I'm sure we've all been along to them, is about what will the impact be on local schools, on local health services. Um, so if you are a developer and you come to those events and you don't understand the area and you haven't done that baseline work to understand the data, then you're not really bringing a well thought out proposal. So I accept there, there probably might be some issues around data sharing in the public sector, but by putting the onus on the applicant, that can only, I imagine, um, improve good practice. But is Alex really saying that the critique of that report would still lie with the, the planning authority to look at the numbers? understand the data and hopefully get the best outcome for for communities. Well it would and, and at the end of the day if an applicant close, uh, sorry, if an applicant if an applicant comes forward and says there will be no impact on health, take my example with the village that I live in, where there's 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 nine hundred houses to be built and, and, and the the view is that there would be no impact on health, then that can be challenged at the planning stage. But it means that the, 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 as, as the application is submitted, then the application says quite clearly that they have consulted with the different authorities and this will be the impact on local public services. At the current time, it is not working, and houses are being built and built and built, and on the pressure has been put on public services. Just look at the the um, the incredible. We really need just look at the closed. incredible, but it's important convener. Well, just look at the incredible situation with education in the Dunfermline Eastern expansion, where there is catchment review after catchment review 
kids being put further and further away from their communities because nobody properly planned for the education of the children in that major development. That cannot be allowed to continue, and therefore we need to get some kind of, of legislation in there that ensures that the impact on local services is very clear when these developments are being put forward at the early planning stage. Thank you. Uh, sorry, Graham, and then yourself, Annabelle. Graham, you wanted to come in. Uh, convener, I'm, I'm well aware we're uh, up, up against the clock here, so I'm, I'm very happy not to speak to this group. OK, thank you. OK, Annabelle. very briefly, thank you. Convener, um, yes, I mean, I've listened carefully to, to what Mr Riley has said. I mean, as the constituency MSP for Cowden Beath, I'm well aware of issues uh, that are raised uh, constantly by constituents across the constituency with concerns about how the planning process interfaces with uh, a look at health service impact. Um, but I would have thought, uh, looking at, at taking into account all circumstances, including particularly considering potential con inherent conflicts of interest, that it would be the planning authority that would be best placed to uh, consider uh, and deal with uh, 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 the health service uh, uh, capacity impacts. Uh, they are the local planning authority, and, and I, I would have thought in terms of the present situation, that is what they routinely should be doing in any event. In terms of the bill, uh, the member may be aware that, in fact, further to amendments that have been passed by this committee at stage two, uh, there are a number of changes that will be coming to ensure that, for example, the local development plan takes into account the capacity of health services, uh, that the, uh, the local development plan also uh, looks at uh, issues of uh, the impact on education services, that the national planning framework considers the impacts of the development on the capacity of existing, existing health services in the area. So actually, and you know, I, I appreciate the member is not currently a member of this committee, but he may not have been aware that actually the committee has been looking at these issues very carefully, these very important issues, and further to discussion in committee has agreed that these issues should indeed be far more uh, front and uh, centre focused in the planning process. So uh, for those reasons, I think that we have moved on a pace from what the member is talking about, and I will be uh, uh, not supporting that particular member okay, for those thank, reasons. Thank you very much, Annabelle. Uh, Minister? Uh, can I ask for some clarity first, convener? Is uh, Amendment 207 in the name of Polly McNeill and the Amendment 210? Be, the law be has moved. not been moved. They, they will be moved or they won't be moved? No, it won't be. Uh, Daniel it's Johnson's 210. So, Sorry? Daniel Johnson's. Yeah, 207, 29, 210. You're not, those won't be moved? No. Okay. Right, so we'll miss out um, Pauline McNeil um, and we'll move um, straight on to uh, amendments 228, 229, and 114. Uh, which all require applications to include information that relates to the capacity of infrastructure and services. Uh, these are, of course, key issues that planning authorities must consider. In particular, they should be considered in development planning in partnership with other parts of the local authority and community planning partnerships. Uh, one of the aims of having a chief planning officer is to make sure that the planning service is fully involved in ongoing conversations about the capacity of services and where additional provision is needed. That information will then be taken into account uh, in considering applications, but I don't believe these proposals uh, put the responsibilities in the right places. Um, Amendment 228 from Claudia Beamish appears to require an applicant for a national or major development to submit a national infrastructure needs assessment as prepared by the Low Carbon Infrastructure Commission proposed in Ms Beamish's Amendment 220. Uh, since that amendment was not agreed, this provision now has nothing to refer to, and I, I hope that um, Claudia Beamish will uh, withdraw that amendment. Alex... Uh, of course. I, I, I thank the Minister. Um, uh, it, it's simply to ask the Minister if he recognises the importance of these issues in terms of future-proofing um, major infrastructure projects, and if he could clarify how that, that is being done or will be done if it's not in this place. Uh, well, one of the things which we are doing, conveners, many folk are aware, is ensuring that the next national planning framework will be aligned with national transport um, strategy to get that absolutely right. At a regional and local level, um, one of the things which I have argued, uh, not 
not only as a, a minister, not only as a, a, an MSP, but also as a councillor, um, that local authorities actually need to take uh, more cognizance of their local development plan when they're putting together their capital spending plans to make sure um, that there is alignment in that regard. Um, if I can turn to Mr Riley's Amendment 114, uh, which would similarly require applicants to prepare a report for any major development on the likely effect on a range of services. Scottish ministers would be required to make regulations on what consideration is to be given to those issues before planning permission is granted. It would also require such a report to be considered before the planning authority enters into a planning obligation. The amendment specifies a somewhat arbitrary category of development and list of issues that must be considered in all cases. Um, it seems to me unlikely, convener, that a large wind farm would have any impact on these services, for example, while a relatively small housing estate that would not count as a major development could have a significant impact in a particular area. Uh, there is also no detail on how those assessments are to be carried out, and it leaves it to the applicant to decide what other public amenities might be relevant. Uh, but the information on the capacity of these services lies with the local authority and the local health board anyway. Surely uh, they are better placed to consider the impact of new development on their services uh, rather than an applicant. Uh, and the planning authority is already legally obliged to consider those issues where they are relevant. Uh, this amendment would only add a necessary process to the system, and I can't support it. Um, Mr Finney's Amendment 229 uh, would require that all applications for planning permission from health boards and local authorities include evidence of consideration of population growth and projections. Uh, as I said before, it's important to carefully define the developments affected by such requirements. In this case, the requirement would apply to all applications by local authorities and health boards, no matter how small the development. So even uh, you know, making a, a new entrance to a building or putting up a fence uh, would, would count in these regards. On the other hand, applications relating to new service provision may not necessarily be made by the health board or the local authority. They may be made by a private sector development partner or a separate provider such as a GP or dental practice. So I don't believe this amendment hits the mark that it's actually aiming at. But again, discussions on population projections and the need for the new service provision should be happening uh, at the development planning stage and be taken into account in all relevant cases. That information should not need to be provided separately for each application. This amendment would add unnecessary requirements uh, that I think in, uh, in many cases would be irrelevant uh, to many of the applications it applies to. Um, indeed, I'll take Mr Finney. Would the Minister accept that, 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 that there's always discretion to go into layers of detail? In any case, that information should be readily available to inform decision making. I, I think it, it's the definition again of the amendment, which is something that I've spoken to you on many occasions during the passage um, of this bill. Um, you know, if any member um, requires help with definition um, and getting an amendment right, I'm more than happy for them to talk to officials as Ms Beamish and, uh, and certain others have um, <laughs> a, a, a around about this. If Mr Finney wants to talk to officials about how he wants to actually get this spot on right, I'm happy for him to do so, but I hope that he doesn't press his amendment today. Uh, amendment 113 uh, in the name of Monica Lennon would require Scottish ministers uh, to make regulations on the consideration of health effects before planning permission is granted for major or national developments. Health can indeed be a material consideration in deciding an application, depending on the nature of the development and other circumstances in the, of the case. Where it is a material consideration, planning authorities are required to consider it. And part of the vision of uh, National Planning Framework uh, 3 is the 
creation of living environments that fosters better health and of course we'll be reviewing that together with relevant parts of Scottish planning policy after the bill. In addition, the Town and Country Planning Environmental Impact Assessment Scotland Regulations 2017 includes requirements to consider significant environmental impacts regarding, amongst other things, population and human health. These regulations have their own detailed list of criteria regarding the applications to which they apply. Uh, this may not necessarily cover every single major or national development, but it identifies those where such assessment is relevant, including some local developments. I therefore believe we have sufficient provision in place to allow for consideration of health impacts where appropriate, and I do not support Amendment 113. I'll take an intervention from Ms Lennon. Thank you, um, Minister. Something that's been um, frustrating locally um, where I am in South Lanarkshire is that with some major applications, let's just use the example of an incinerator, um, Stakeholders have been told that, that health would be considered at a later stage by SEPA uh, through the licensing regime. So it's not always the case that health is front-loaded and fully considered by planning authorities. Does that mean that planning authorities are not upholding the law and planning requirements, or is there a lack of guidance which is um, facilitating consistency across Scotland? Uh, convener, as Ms uh, Lennon is well aware, as she raises this issue on a regular basis, I cannot comment on live applications. What I will do is I will ensure that officials write to Ms Lennon um, uh, with all of the details and guidance that applies in these uh, cases. Um, convener, um, I, 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 I think Ms Lennon says that she was going to move 209 from uh, Mr Johnson, is that correct? No, no, no. She's no. going to move 307. Uh, yeah. 307. Ah. Right, OK, let me turn then to, to 307. Uh, I'm not aware of any particular calls for councillors, MSPs and MPs to be directly notified of planning uh, applications. All local authorities uh, publish weekly lists of new applications for planning permission, which are available on their websites, uh, and information relating to major applications can easily be extracted from authorities' online systems. Uh, major developments will also have been subject to pre-application consultation, uh, including local advertising, and may have been included in the consultation process for the local development plan. Uh, I should warn members that as drafted, this amendment would require notification of uh, a range of subsidiary applications for approval in addition to the ma main uh, planning permission. List MSPs in particular uh, may find that they receive more notifications uh, than they might expect. Uh, however, this is not a significant burden for planning authorities and I'm happy to support the amendment. Thank you very much. Uh, can I ask Claudia Beamish to wind up? I, I don't wish to wind up. Thank you, convener. Thank you very much. In that case, can I uh, call Amendment 228 in the name of Claudia Beamish? Claudia Beamish uh, to move or not move? Press not move. Withdraw. Press withdraw. Press withdraw. Sorry, my apologies. Sorry. Withdraw. Withdraw, thank you. Uh, Claudia Beamer wishes to withdraw the amendment. Does any member present object to this amendment being withdrawn? In that case, the amendment is withdrawn. Thank you. Uh, call amendment 229 in the name of John Finney. Already debated with amendment 207. John Finney to move or not move? Move. Thank you. The question is that amendment 229 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Those in favour of the amendment? Okay. Those opposed? The amendment falls 7-0. I call amendment 113 in the name of Monica Lennon, already debated with amendment 207. Monica Lennon to move or not move? Move. The question is that amendment 113 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Those in favour? Those opposed? Four, uh, four in favour, three opposed. The amendment is carried. I call amendment 114 in the name of Alec Rowley, already debated with amendment 207. Alec Rowley to move or not move? Move. Thank you. Uh, the question is that amendment 114 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Those in favour of amendment 114? One. Those opposed? Six. The amendment falls. 
The question therefore is that sections 13 and 14 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. I call amendment 181 in the name of the Minister, already debated with amendment 2. Minister, to move formally. Move to convener. Thank you. The question is that amendment 181 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Uh, those in favour of amendment 181? Those opposed? The amendment 181 falls 4 3. Um, I am delighted to say that brings us to a, a close of uh, the planning bill stage 2. Uh, day five of the planning bill. Uh, the, the day, stay, uh, day five of stage two will take place on the thirty first of October, when the committee's target is the end of section twenty six. Any further amendments for provisions up to that point should be lodged by twelve noon on Thursday, twenty fifth October tomorrow. Yes. Oh no, that no, can't no, be right. That can't be right. But we we didn't vote three or something. Yeah, is it next time? Does that, does that come through to you or something? Yeah, that will come through the next time. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. Can I get clarity in terms right. of uh, where you intend to be to next? Right, OK. Day five of the stage two will take place next Wednesday. Now, the committee's target is the end of the section 26 which is a bit ambitious, I suspect, given where we are just now. Uh, any, f any further amendments for provisions up to that point should be lodged by 12 noon on Thursday. Yeah. Close the meeting. I thank the Minister and close the meeting. <laughs>